Hi, good morning and welcome to the Vermont Legislature's House Committee on Environment and Energy. This morning, we're gonna continue taking testimony on S5 and we have Neil Lunderville from Vermont Gas with us this morning. Welcome. Hey. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Great to be with you. My name is Neil Lunderville. I'm the President and CEO of Vermont Gas Systems, VGS. Uh, in addition, well, before I was in this role, just a little bit about me. I, uh, I, I served as the uh, general manager of the Burlington Electric Department in Burlington, Vermont, for four years. I've also served various uh, roles in the, uh, in, for the state, including <clears throat> Secretary of Transportation and Secretary of Administration for Governor Jim Douglas and Irene Recovery Officer for Governor Peter Shumlin. So today I'm here to talk about S5, the Affordable Heat Act. And uh, I would like to start, if it's all right with folks, to just talk a little bit about BGS, Vermont Gas, and about what we do, uh, what, what we do, how, how we're doing it, and the things we're doing to, uh, uh, to address climate change, and then talk about the bill specifically, and then leave plenty of time for questions. I understand, I'm sure I have 45 minutes. This, okay, but I'll, I'll probably take about... 20, 20 minutes or so to talk, and then leave time for questions. Uh, and but you can always, of course, interrupt me at any point that it might be helpful to get clarification on something. So, uh, VGS, we, 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 Vermont Gas Systems is our, our, our sort of formal name. We call ourselves VGS. You hear me refer to it as VGS a lot. Uh, VGS is the is the largest thermal energy provider in Vermont. We serve about fifty five thousand customers in. Northwestern Vermont and Franklin, Addison, uh, at Chittenden and Addison counties. We have a, a pipe that runs from uh, <coughs> from the Canadian border at, at Highgate um, that runs down through Franklin, Chittenden, and down to Middlebury, a transmission pipe. And from that, we have distribution lines um, that run out to various communities and service lines that connect our customers. Um, and through those lines, we uh, we serve natural gas directly to customers. Uh, that's been our principal business for. Uh, for almost for over 50 years, uh, going on 55 years, 55 plus years at this point. So in that sense, we're a distribution utility. We're distributing uh, natural gas, but we're also an energy efficiency utility. We have, uh, like uh, like EV efficiency from our committee today, we do thermal energy efficiency for our customers, program that we actually started uh, in 1992, so now over uh, it's a lot of years, um, 30 years. So we've been, we've been doing energy efficiency work. 2016, we got an order of refinement um, from the Public Utility uh, Commission, and that makes us a, a also an energy efficiency utility, an official energy efficiency utility. And more recently, we've, we have sought to become a, an integrated energy services provider, meaning that we're doing more than just serving gas and doing efficiency, but also looking at a whole range of other... other innovative, sustainable uh, uh, energy uh, uh, ways uh, to serve our customers, which I'm going to talk a lot about today. So we, um, we've always had a history of innovation at BGS going back to when we first started uh, the company. I, I wasn't there, obviously, but uh, back in 1966, when the first lines were drawn in and the first customers were connected, uh, we were displacing what was then a, 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 a dirtier and a more expensive source of energy, either oil, or propane, in some places, in some cases, uh, uh, coal gas or manufactured gas. So, right from our history, we were we were at innovation ourselves at the beginning. Uh, but over the the last fifty five plus years, we have been continuing that innovation. I mentioned the energy efficiency utility, um, and then bring us up to the, the the sort of the the forward time that we're in. Uh, in twenty nineteen, uh, we set a new course with the launch of our climate action plan. Um, we did that for a lot of reasons, and, and I, I want to spend a little time on that because it's important to, um, to, to understand that relative to our support for this bill. Our long-term objective. Neil? Yes. So your, our climate action plan, do you mean the states? Or I'm sorry, uh, the, the VGS climate action plan. So in, in 2019, we, the VGS launched uh, our climate action plan. Um, why we uh, why we did that? Um, our long term objective is to provide zero net zero emissions energy to our customers uh, at a price safely, reliably, and at a price that they can afford. We recognize that natural gas, despite the many benefits that we've been able to deliver to our customers, safe, reliable, 
it's affordable, something our customers really like, they're really happy to, to receive it. But despite all those benefits, it does contribute to climate change. It's in fact a significant driver of climate change generally if you look through, through the world. So we acknowledge natural gas plays a role in climate change. And with that acknowledgement means that we have a responsibility to address that. Now we can't do that overnight. We can't just turn off the, the line and, and stop serving customers. That would be irresponsible, it wouldn't make sense. Um, so in 2019, we launched our climate plan with the idea that we will undertake a transformation of our own business to serve in a more <laughs> environmentally sustainable way without sacrificing the core values that make us who we are, which is the safe, reliable, affordable delivery of energy for our customers. So we're doing that in three principal ways. Uh, and th these sort of are the building blocks for, for our climate plan and for all the work that we're doing. The first, and, and in a lot of ways, the most important, the place we always start when we think about climate action, is energy efficiency. How can we use less energy? Because we have our own energy efficiency program, this is, a, this is really easy for us. Um, we start by thinking about how we can just simply deliver more energy efficiency services to our customers, how we get them to use less over time. So if we think about the, our entire uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, uh, right today, and we look out for out 30 years, the first block of how we reduce that is we simply get our customers to use less energy. Um, that is a benefit overall. And we know it's not just a climate benefit, um, but, but homes that are weatherized are also comfortable. Um, they're, they're, they're put money in people's pockets right away. Uh, and I think there's strong support for, um, for weatherization among our customers, certainly among the legislature. Um, one of the other uh, roles that I have is the uh, co-chair of the Energy Action Network Weatherization at Scale uh, Network Action Team. We've something we've been working on for years too. Uh, work with partners in the legislature to, in fact, get more money overall for weatherization so that we can start to meet those very robust um, weatherization goals. At VGS, we want to do our part there, and that forms the cornerstone of our efforts around our climate plan. The second part of it is what we call our in-home innovation. This is how we are, we are working to go inside of our customers' homes and help them uh, with sustainable solutions to either use less energy at, at systems level or to make conversions to, uh, uh, to different ways to, to heat their homes. For instance, uh, last year, we were the first gas utility in the country to launch an electric heat pump water heater program. Uh, now, a lot of gas utilities won't even think about working on electric. We disagree. Ultimately, it's what's best for our customers uh, and, 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 how they're able to continue to warm their homes uh, and businesses in a way that is safe, <coughs> excuse me, reliable and, and cost effective for them. And heat pump water heaters do just that. Uh, this year, we're launching a, a hybrid heat plan where we will be putting in electric heat pump, uh, electric heat pumps alongside of furnaces so that these systems are, are hybrid using electricity um, when the, the system supports them, temperatures support it, and when it gets too cold, the the uh, natural gas system kicks on to make sure that it is uh, even heat for, for our customers. We've been piloting this for some months and we're a couple months away from launching this product. So when we're able to, to deliver this kind of in-home uh, innovation, that's another way that we think about. First, we make the home efficient. Second, we, we deliver energy in a different way to them or allow them to, to get their heat in a different way. That's the second way that we drop our, our, our overall greenhouse gas emissions. The third piece is to displace fossil fuels with alternative supply. And this gets into a whole range of activities um, where we are simply using less fossil gas. And this includes renewable natural gas. It includes green hydrogen, which I can talk more, a little bit more about. It includes things like geothermal energy. How are we using um, ground source heat pumps or networked ground source heat pumps to deliver energy to, to people's homes. It also looks at things like district energy. We've been working for years with, with Burlington Electric in the city of Burlington to take the steam from the McNeil, the McNeil biomass plant in Burlington and pipe it up to the institutions on the hill to displace fossil gas in their boilers. That's a project that uh, we've been studying the feasibility with really closely with Burlington Electric in the city. And we ultimately hope to have a go or no-go decision very soon on, on that project. All of those things will displace fossil gas. That, that represents the third big chunk 
of how we reach our climate action plan goals. Our climate action plan goals, VGS's climate action plan, plan goals, are also the Global Warming Solutions Act requirements. They align. We set, we launched our, our plan in 2019. Global Warming Solutions Act was passed after that, but we said our 2030 goal is the state's 2030 goal, which is 40% less than, than uh, greenhouse gas emissions than 19, uh, the 1990 levels. We, we believe that uh, we are on track to do that. And ultimately, uh, we believe that uh, the Affordable Heat Act will, uh, will help us um, achieve that, that goal. A couple other things about, about VGS before I turn to uh, turn a little bit more closely to the bill. Um, we have about 130, 100, 135, 140 uh, employees that work uh, out of uh, in our in our company that work out of office uh, principal offices in South Burlington, but we have uh, satellites in Addison County and, and Franklin County. Um, we also, as I mentioned before, we our energy efficiency program is pretty robust. We have a pretty large energy efficiency team works really closely with EVT and also Burlington Electric um, to help customers. We think it's uh, I mentioned I mentioned that. Um, it's a cornerstone for us, but it's also a cornerstone that our customers really love it. We, we know from asking our customers, they really appreciate when our technicians can go in and help them get their homes um, more comfortable. Um, and we also uh, uh, provide income qualified assistance programs uh, to help the most energy and um, income, uh, low in energy burdened and low income customers. Um, a big part of when we think about affordability is we think about affordability for low and moderate income customers, those least able um, to pay. So a lot of our efforts are really targeted to think about how we can help those low and moderate income customers first um, so that they have options to uh, have uh, sustainable, affordable, long-term energy, uh, energy for the long-term. So we, uh, one of the things that it, as we've undertaken this, this journey since 2019 to uh, work on our uh, VGS climate plan, um, we have been pushing a lot of innovative uh, ideas. I mentioned already the heat pump water heater program. Um, I, I mentioned a little bit about our, our weatherization rebates for low and moderate income. Um, we've also been doing a lot of research around geothermal. Uh, we've actually participated in an electric boiler pilot. We have JP, that's, that's, we don't serve JP now. They actually are been a big uh, propane customer, but they're um, installing an electric boiler to displace propane. It's a project that we got involved in. We get involved in it because we want to understand how electric boilers might be a viable solution, especially for large invest commercial and industrial customers. Um, so uh, we, we've also been involved, as I mentioned, the, the green hydrogen. We're doing a pilot um, a project with Global Foundries, uh, the, the semiconductor facility in Essex, and uh, with our research partner, UVM. Uh, to pilot how we can use renewable energy to create uh, hydrogen, hydrogen that's ultimately blended uh, directly into the gas supply, displacing fossil gas at the boiler, um, uh, at the global boundaries plant. We think hydrogen has a lot of value for large commercial industrial customers, which are really hard to decarbonize. We know this from the science. They can't just install a heat pump and do some weatherization work and help to, to displace all the world. We need things that um, can deliver energy at scale, and green hydrogen um, has some real promise to be able to do that. Um, Excuse me. Yes, of course. One more time. Yeah. How you're creating the green hydrogen? Sure. Uh, we um, is the project that's still uh, in the early phases of putting the engineering together for it, um, but we will uh, ultimately uh, use renewable electricity to uh, to run an electrolyzer that will. Um, <clears throat> that will be run, that water will run over the electrolyzer, just H2O. It'll split the H2O into uh, oxygen and hydrogen, and the oxygen will be released out and the hydrogen will be captured. That hydrogen will be, will be, will be uh, blended directly into the gas stream um, and fed into the, the boiler at Global Foundries. That hydrogen can bust, and when it can bust, because it, it unlike uh, CH4, which does release carbon, the CH4 being methane does release carbon, the hydrogen, the H2, the hydrogen doesn't release any carbon. It is sort of carbon-free uh, energy. Um, uh, the early phase of that project will use uh, power from um, the, the grid. The later phases of that project will use uh, renewable um, um, power, some of which will be generated right at the plant. And the definition of renewable electricity is? Is, uh, for instance, solar, uh, wind, uh, hydro, uh, 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 hydroelectric. So in doing all of this, uh, 
this innovation work, one thing that we, we realized is that we can only go so far um, to be able to do that um, with the sort of the current statutory and regulatory construct. And that ultimately, uh, in order to achieve the global warming solutions and requirements, uh, we need some additional the green book statute and 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 regulatory uh, framework to be able to do it, and this is something that we have uh, we've been thinking about and working on for some time. Um, and and as I'll come back to, um, S five does provide a lot of that um, framework for us to continue to grow in in this direction in the future. Um, we have been involved with the, the development of uh, of a clean heat standard or the Affordable Heat Act for some time. We were early participants in the Energy Action uh, Network's clean heat, clean heat standard development process. It actually started back in uh, uh, 2020, um, something that, that I've personally been involved in uh, quite a bit. Uh, and we've, we put in, we've provided input, technical support for development of the white paper the legislation uh, at, at, at different points, and we've spent a lot of time reviewing the concepts that have that are that are ingrained into to S five. This all leads me to say that uh, we support S five, the Affordable Heat Act, um, as it is passed by the Senate. We supported it as it was introduced. Um, we actually supported H seven fifteen that was passed last year as well. And uh, as I'll talk about, S five we believe makes. Um, <laughs> Um, improvements uh, on that. It also adds some complexity, um, which I'll, I'll, I'll flag a note of caution um, as, I, as I talk about that. Um, what we support S5 uh, and because we believe that a balanced thermal sector performance standard will give us the clear guidance and framework that we need to achieve the state's requirements under the Global Warming Solutions Act. Importantly, we believe that a, a balanced market-based system where we have obligated parties that need to generate or, or acquire clean heat credits is one that will, that will promote lowest cost, most more most cost effective solutions toward meeting our, our climate challenges in the future. And this bill provides for that market-based approach by having a, a tradable system of clean heat credits um, and allowing obligated parties like ourselves to be able to, uh, to generate and and acquire those. Um, this is, we think this is an important, a really important piece of, of the legislation. We wanna make sure ultimately that we have a, the, the widest array of flexible options to address uh, our greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets. We also wanna make sure that, that, that those clean heat measures are compared apples to apples. So there's a part in this bill, which I'm sure you've heard about the life cycle emissions analysis. This is where Every clean heat measure is compared against the other through a, a process by which you're, you're studying the fuel pathway, you're studying the other um, uh, carbon, in, uh, carbon impacts of, of any measure, and then ultimately getting a, a score for those clean heat measures. This sort of uh, life cycle emissions analysis, we think is a really transparent, fair, and equitable way to achieve this that creates the, uh, the market to allow the system to really work. I'd also say that uh, the uh, S5 is an improvement over, over last year's bill because it strengthens how we support low and moderate income customers. Um, there are new provisions that are in S5 that weren't in last year's bill that put more of the, the effort on making sure that low and moderate income customers are protected. Uh, ultimately, um, we need to keep our, our, a really close eye on the people who can least afford to pay um, in this because uh, you know, and the energy markets, as we've seen, there's a lot of volatility in those. Um, that's going to happen whether the S5 goes forward or not, that volatility persists. The only way that we can protect low and moderate income customers for the long term and help future proof them against the ups and downs is to provide them in their homes flexibility and optionality to, to warm their homes. And this means a combination of systems. This means a weatherized home. It means a, a, a home that has a heat pump backed up by natural gas, uh, propane or oil. Uh, and it means that, the, uh, that they can, um, in, in all seasons, uh, heat and cool their home in a way that's both safe, reliable, and affordable. Um, I think another important part of, of S5, and one of the reasons we support it, is that it does not mandate any of these changes on customers. 
customers retain full choice of what, how they choose to heat their home in the future. Um, we want customers to have that choice. We think that choice is important to make the, the system work. And you know, we don't want to be in a position to tell customers how they should heat their home. We want to give them the options and, and the affordable options to be able to make, the, to make good choices. And, and at VGS, we are, um, that's the work that we're doing. Um, I want to, uh, I want to, I, I noted that uh, S5 adds some complexity over last year's bill, and I wanted to flag that a little bit for, for the committee. Um, as compared to last year's bill, uh, this bill is somewhat more, uh, it has a sort of a narrower set of, of clean heat measures that, uh, that, that we can do. It, they're both uh, changes to uh, carbon intensity score process, um, there are, there are addition, there's additional specificity on the types and quantities of credits. Uh, all these things increase the complexity that, that, uh, that we will have as an obligated party to be able to deliver that. I think that S5, as, came, as it came to the Senate, does hold the balance well, but I would, I would encourage the committee not to add additional complexity to that because if we add complexity and inflexibility, it, it serves to make the bill harder to implement, and, which ultimately will make it less affordable. So by having a really balanced approach there um, is ultimately what makes the bill um, really workable from, from our perspective. Um, and, uh, uh, and when you pull all these parts together, uh, you uh, get a, a piece of legislation that we think creates this generational opportunity to uh, make our energy, our, our thermal energy, uh, more sustainable for for the long term. One thing I want to address is is the fact that that uh, that this sort of transformation is not costless. There will be a cost to this. Uh, there will be a cost that will be ultimately borne by obligated parties and by our our customers. Uh, but I also think that uh, that we are well positioned to manage these costs because we are fully regulated, we're an established company, um, and we have been working for years now uh, to pull things in place to be able to, to, um, uh, to move quickly to help our customers take advantage of this. I also flag that along with cost come benefits. Every time we need to, when we, when we think about how we uh, make this transformation, we need to be making investments, both as companies and as Vermonters, um, to put in place the things that will allow us to have uh, less volatile uh, energy sources over the last year, and, and largely due to the war in Ukraine, uh, but also other forces at play, we've seen the commodity cost of gas go um, from a, a year, year and a half ago, it went up three times, 300%. Um, the commodity cost was about $3 per MCF uh, or MMBTU, which is the unit we operate in, and it went at one point over $10 for one of those. And then it's come back down again, it's now down to around $2 in MNBTU, but that demonstrates the wild volatility that we have seen. Certainly, the oil propane markets have seen similar volatility. One way we unhook from this volatility is we provide customer options and flexibility. That's a really important part of this. And it, thinking in the long term, that's the kind of uh, flexibility and optionality that our, our customers need uh, to be able to manage um, the changes in, in, in the market. Um, the the uh, uh, the Affordable Heat Act and Clean Heat, the Clean Heat Standard that, that it rides along with it, um, does allow us to provide incentives for customers to make the switch toward, toward these more um, robust systems in their homes. Um, that's, a, that, that is, that's sort of the, the mechanism that allows us to make these, these transformations. And uh, we, uh, we think this is a pretty, uh, a pretty important piece of what we're going to do, and ultimately we can help our customers take advantage of. Um, I think I'll just close by, by saying there's a, a lot of the work in, in this bill will be done by um, the Public Utility Commission and a technical advisory group. And I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, there's a lot of uh, technical pieces in this when it, when it comes to um, uh, outlining the, the types of, of credits um, that the, the score for, for the credits that will be available, the life cycle analysis, a lot of the other pieces. Um, we have great comfort in that we've we have, have a long history of working with Public Utility Commission and technical advisory groups in other areas. Um, we think this is a, a sort of a tried and true methodology that has worked, served us well um, in Vermont overall, not just for uh, VGS, but for other regulated entities such as the electric distribution utilities. Uh, and uh, this is a, this is a, uh, 
a, a good measure that's that that makes sense in the bill. Um, so with that, um, I'm really pleased to to uh, offer our thoughts on it, express our support um, for the bill, encourage you to continue the uh, the good work that was set forward by the Senate. Um, we're happy. I'm happy to answer questions today, and we're also happy to be a resource to the committee. Um, on this bill or any other bills that that, that are relative to our, to our areas here. So, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, uh, Representative Bongart. Um, you described the things that you are doing already to really, you get, I think you described <laughs> that you're on your way, you're trying to get to 40% plus by 2030 in any event. And then you said that, um, but, but, the, but the mechanisms that will be put in place by the bill will help help, help you yeah. do that. And so on the one hand, I'm, I just I just want to understand it because you would earn credits by doing what you're already doing, which would mean you wouldn't have to pay anything in. So how do you actually benefit by the, by the system beyond what you're already doing? You're already kind of in the business of transformation. So you get those credits and how, how, do they, how does that actually how does the new market actually benefit you for what you're already doing? Yeah, so a bit, I'll be more clear on that on that point. Um, some of the things that we're doing are running up against uh, a wall because we are we can only go so far as a regulated utility in with the current statutory construct that we have, particularly in areas. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a lot of different areas, but we, we run up against that wall in, in some places. So there are things like geothermal um, that we, we might like to do more of that, um, that we really, that, that there's not sort of the statutory backup to allow us to do right now. A clean heat standard, Affordable Heat Act will un unlock some of those areas for us because they will allow us to press forward sort of more aggressively into those spaces and deliver more value to um, our customers over over the long term. So we need the additional statutory uh, framework to be able to have uh, the regulation that would allow us to go forward in those areas. So we do, we, if we didn't have something like this, we'd have to, we'd have to get creative and find other ways to do it. But, but ultimately this sort of framework as a performance standard as set forward in, in S5 does give us much more latitude to be able to do that kind of work um, and at a, at, a, at a quicker pace. And ultimately I think at a more affordable cost for our customers. Can you still elaborate a little bit more about some of the, the blocks, the roadblocks that you're running into, the, the regulatory obstacles. Um, why are why are they there, and what what are they? What, is, what exactly is going on? With some of that. Yeah, and they're they're. I'm happy to talk about a, a few of them. Um, they're uh, they're they're all there for good reason. You know, there there's a there's a long. Uh, uh, a long history of, of, uh, of strong, solid regulation. Uh, a lot of it has to do with how we operate um, in, our, in our footprint. That is the, the area where we have pipe and have our customers connected. Uh, ultimately, we'd like to be able to uh, add additional customers. Uh, we have things like geothermal, network geothermal, that might be outside of our service territory uh, because we are a gas utility, regulated gas utility that is sort of, there's an uh, interpretation that we are, uh, restricted to our, our service territory, ultimately a cleaning standard, but allow us to move outside of that service territory, serve new customers with um, the safe, reliable, affordable energy that we think we can provide. Um, that's, I think, one example um, where this bill certainly would help that. Um, there are probably other examples, but that's the first one that springs to mind. Thanks. Uh, Representative Sackowitz, then Smith. Yeah, thank you. I have the it's the same question as um, Representative Bongart's, and I was very curious, very interested in your answer. And I, I guess I still don't feel like I understand what the disconnect is for you between what your plans are already and how it would be helped with by S5. It seems like you've said that it, that it would, that there's things that would open up, but I'm wondering if you could really be very a lot more specific about like maybe just pick an example of how this bill would help you do something that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise um we'll take geothermal as a good example for this uh we uh, we recently petitioned to uh the public utility commission to do a geothermal pilot in rutland rutland today is outside of our service territory our service territory extends only to middlebury which is where our pipe is um, ultimately, the Public Utility Commission denied that uh, application for us to do that pilot in part because it, it is outside of our service territory. Now, 
with a clean heat standard in place. Um, that is the kind of activity that would uh, displace, in this case, propane um, for the customer by putting in a ground source heat pump um, that could deliver the energy more cost effectively and with a lower uh, carbon profile. Cleaning standard would give us the ability to, to do that kind of project, get a clean heat credit for it, and get a clean heat credit against our annual obligation. So that's a, a really concrete example of where in, in real life where we we can't take action um, uh, because we don't have the statutory uh, framework that will allow the regulators to give us the ability to move in this direction. That's helpful. Representative Smith. Thank you. Uh, going along, thank you. Uh, going along with uh, Representative's question, can Vermont gas succeed without S5? to succeed at their goals yeah I mean, we're we're a, we're a tenacious and creative bunch you know so we're we're gonna we are uh we're gonna work with whatever is put in front of us but at the same time i think we will be able to thrive uh, more with s5 and able to make our work toward uh, our climate goals and <clears throat> serve our customers better with a bill like s5 in place you know, specifically a performance standard that allows for a balanced market-based approach um, to to reducing greenhouse gas emissions over the long term. That is, you know, a program like that, which gives us a, which gives us the agency to have a lot of flexibility in how we deliver those greenhouse gas emissions, uh, really allows uh, fuel providers to, you know, to be creative and to really find those low cost solutions that um, will allow us to meet to both meet our our environmental goals, but also um, keep costs low for, for customers. Um, so, so we need, we ultimately need something like S5. If, if we didn't have it, it would make it more difficult for us to get there. But you could succeed. Well, we, we, we I think we, 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 I I'm, I'm, I guess, a tenacious and uh, driven. So we're going to find a way to succeed no matter what. But I, but I, but I, to be clear, I think a program like S5 uh, or, or would be set in place like it, through S5 would, would allow us to do that. Um, more quickly and in, us, and in a more robust way that would serve our customers better in the long run. Thank you. And um, another question. <clears throat> when you started your presentation, uh, uh, it, I, it led to my thought of, are you in competition with the Vermont fuel dealers? Uh, at the burner tip, we are. Um, you know, we, uh, we have to compete at the burner tip um, with the fuel, we are a fuel, so I should say, start by saying we are a Vermont fuel dealer. Um, we are a member of the Vermont Fuel Dealers Association. Oil dealer. Right, the oil and propane customers. So uh, we compete with oil, propane, and electricity um, for service. Uh, and that, that's happening today. It's been happening for the last, you know, 55 years, uh, plus years for our, for our customers. So we are in competition. Okay. I was going to try to find out while, we, while I was listening to your testimony, how many mobile homes are in Vermont? And yeah. I will find out, and we, I don't need an answer now. Okay, not sure I know. <laughs> no, I'm sure. But from what I understand, heat pumps are not gonna work in a mobile home. Uh, and there's no such thing as a $3,500 heat pump in a mobile home because of the added expenses to set up a mobile home, or if they can be even set up. How are you gonna help these low-income people I mean, you're going to have incentives uh, and, and assist them in that, but is it going to be a 50% incentive to help these people or, or a 5% incentive? Because whatever you do decide for an incentive amount, it's still going to be a struggle for these people living that way and that are making 40, 35, 40 grand a year. Yeah, I... Um... I I know well the the, the struggles of, of low income Vermonters, and I I have a true passion for weatherization, uh, in part because I grew up in a home where when the wind would come off the lake in Colchester, it would lift the carpet off the floor. Um, that's how weatherized it wasn't. I know that feeling. Yes, I, I and I know it well too, and spent a lot of nights with my mom she curled up next to the wood stove, um, trying to stay warm. And so, you know, a five percent incentive is not going to help customers like that. Um, you need to bring those incentives almost to almost if including 100% uh, for low income customers. We know this from years of doing weatherization work in this space. Uh, and ultimately, it's those customers that we need to target first and we need to target most aggressively in order to future proof them against any volatility that exists in the energy market. 
Um, th that is that is a passion for BGS. It's a passion of mine personally. And I, but I'd say that in the energy with all the weatherization providers and fuel providers, you'll hear that common refrain. We want our customers to be warm. Warmth is the key. So, That's the business that we're in. So with, with a clean heat standard, we're both obligated by the bill in, in order to, to deliver uh, incentives for uh, low in and moderate income customers. But also in practice, if we want to be able to weatherize those homes and do other upgrades, we're going to need to bring those incentives way up. Not every um, uh, type of of improvement is going to be available for every type of home, whether that's a, a mobile home or just a standalone home. You know, they're, they're really, really, truly are custom jobs for, for everyone. Uh, and uh, I, so I, so I, I know that, that it is, when you look at mobile homes in particular, some things might not work and other things might. Um, I think we have to look at one-off uh, occasion, but importantly, we can't ignore them. We need to look at them squarely and address them early uh, in this bill. And regardless of what you do this bill or not, that, that needs to be part of the policy of the state is helping those low-income Vermonters um, get off the roller coaster of volatility um, that we've faced in Vermont with energy prices uh, over many years now. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Amelia. Yes, thank you. Uh, thanks for your testimony this morning. So I think you gave a great example about the Rutland geothermal um, project that you're in. Uh, for me, when I think about uh, over the years that we've been talking with fossil fuel dealers, um, I myself for years have been saying, how do we help you transition your business? Because we know that you all are key. You have your customers, you need to keep them warm. Uh, we know fossil fuel, um, there's a lot of pressure to reduce it. Uh, how do we help businesses? And so this is a great, um, I love that example um, of how you are diversifying your business uh, model uh, and also, adding workforce into this transition, which is key. Uh, you're in a place where there may be not be workforce. Mm -hmm. You have another example. So I, I've heard you talk about some of the pilots mm -hmm. um, that you're doing. Um, do you have another example of um, diversification, um, how, how your business is transforming to meet the transition? I do. And, and I'll, uh, uh, let me talk a little bit about um, about the, the yeah, uh, let me give you an example. I talk a little bit about the um, forces at play. So, uh, one of the large forces at play in the energy sector globally, certainly nationally, and in here in Vermont, is decarbonization. So, any business that is in the thermal energy sector needs to be thinking about decarbonization um, as one of the major trends that's affecting us for the long term. It's not the only trend. There are other trends like digitalization decentralization this is de digitalization being like tying the, uh, our technology to our to the to sort of the bits and bytes to the molecules and electrons um, and decentralization how we are uh, how how energy is being produced in a smaller scale and being reconnected to the, the greater grid but decarbonization is one of those, you know, those big trends and so we are we are thinking about, about how we can decarbonize across all of these sectors. Let me talk about uh, district energy. I think this is another another area that um, may be a helpful helpful uh, uh, construct because it 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 deals with something that that feels a lot like the business we do now, but is a lot different. Um, so district energy and also network geothermal, they're kind of the same idea. Is that you lay pipes in the ground um, that connect to a thermal energy source that delivers either um, steam or hot water to a, a network series of, of buildings. Um, the big difference is that it's not gas. Uh, so unlike our business now, which you know, we take pipe, we put gas through it. This we take a pipe and we put water or, or water in water form or you know, a liquid form or water in steam form um, through that pipe. This is a pretty big move for, for gas companies. I mean, gas companies have known one thing for a long time, which is putting gas into that pipe, pushing it to the customer's home, running it through the meter, and, and being done with it. But one realization that we had had is that that pipe is really agnostic to what flows through it. It's just a pipe. The pipe doesn't care what's in it. In fact, the pipe that we use for geothermal and district energy <coughs> is the very same pipe that we're going to use to put natural gas in, high-density polyethylene pipe um, you, that you put in the ground. One's, one has a blue stripe and one has a yellow stripe. Yellow stripe for gas, blue stripe for water. Um, they're very, very similar. So we think about, when you talk about workforce, uh, we're thinking about how we can take our existing workforce and transition them from putting 
one type of, of pipe in the ground, actually putting the same type of pipe in the ground, but running a different medium through it to deliver energy. Um, to us, that's a really powerful transformation. We are using the skills that we have honed over 50 years of delivering this kind of energy to customers and tweaking them just slightly to deliver the safe, reliable, uh, and affordable energy for our customers. So I think we have, we think there's great promise for both district energy, which we look at in Burlington, which is steam energy, and geothermal, where we are looking at a variety of different um, uh, 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 different projects that are either networked or single source. Uh, this is an area where companies like ours can can press ahead and deliver real results for customers. Thank you. My second question is. Um, uh, around the creation of the market uh, versus uh, just a direct um, appropriation towards weatherization or fossil fuel reducing measures. Can you speak to the advantage of going with a market yes. or, or lack thereof um, as yeah. opposed to a direct appropriation? Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I believe in markets. I, I think that markets will, you know, over the long term provide uh, the the most cost effective and ultimately the most innovative solutions to challenges that we face. Um, certainly, there's a lot of applications of direct appropriations that that make sense. But if you're looking for a long term, systematic, generational change to how we warm, uh, heat our homes, I um, mean, from our homes and businesses and run our our processes, then we need to be thinking about a market-based approach to that. There are a lot of, I mean, you know, the committee's heard other examples of states that have delivered this kind of market-based solution and the benefits of doing that. Um, I, thinking of Oregon in, in particular and California with um, uh, on the transportation side. So I think that these models have been shown to work uh, and we believe it can work in Vermont just as well. We haven't heard from Oregon. So oh, what is the effect? Uh, what is yeah, the effect? I thought the, it's, it's Corian wind. Not she, yet. Not yet. Okay. So, you know, I, I, I would let her speak to this, the specifics, but, you know, they've implemented a performance standard there. Um, where they've had a, there's a lot of similarities between the Oregon model and what we are, uh, what you're proposing here in S5 um, that allow this market-based approach to work. And what they found is that, it's working quite well. They're getting the, the um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions to, to reductions they desire for a, a pretty affordable price. Um, she can speak to the specifics. I'm not as versed in them. I know, you know the general outlines of the plan, but um, I think it's an important model for us to look at. Okay, there's a lot of questions. I'm going to indulge the chairs for just a second. Um, you talked about this the need for balance in the bill, balance is necessary. I think I heard you say the current version that we have before us is still balanced, it is. but that it narrows the measures. Can you help us understand what the measures narrowed means? Yeah, I, I can. Um, the uh, So I, I it's, it's really my my point was compared to last year's bill, um, which we did support. And, and this year, there are a number of uh, parts in the bill that... Um, that make it just a little, little more challenging to, uh, for the types of things that we would be allowed to, to do. For instance, uh, there's a declining carbon intensity score in the bill um, that uh, will require uh, only certain fuels with, carb with carbon intensity to be eligible for, for clean heat. That's a narrowing of this. It's a narrowing that we, that we support, um, uh, but it is a narrowing of the types of measures that would be uh, allowable here. Um, there's more specificity around uh, fuel pathways that have been included in the bill. Uh, you know, ultimately, I think that there's some good um, precedent for those types of fuel pathway analysis, so we support it. But it does sort of narrow in and and add specificity to that process, um, which will ultimately make it a little bit more complex to um, uh, to, to 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 deliver on. Um, but but it, it is a narrowing. Um, there's more specificity around how we can deliver um, measures for low and moderate income customers. Uh, S5, as compared to H715, um, added that half of the measures for low and moderate income customers have to come from installed measures versus um, uh, fuel supply measures. This, again, is a narrowing um, of, of what would be available in the bill. When you add any one of those, seems like that may be fine. When you add them all together, it just provides fewer options for obligated parties to be able to deliver. We think it still sort of holds the line on balance, but I would encourage the committee not to go further than what's been, been put in the bill already. Thank you. Um, workforce issues have come up yeah. a lot in our conversations. Um, 
how are you addressing those? And um, yeah. Hey, yeah, work for, uh, so uh, we, we have one of the largest uh, thermal workforces in the state of Vermont. And part of our, our team, we have almost 30, uh, we call service technicians. These are the, uh, the folks who go into people's basements and crawl spaces to work on furnaces and boilers and, and actually do the work. Um, so we have, I can say that over the last year plus, we have worked very hard um, to make sure that um, those service tech, that the team of service technicians is fully staffed, um, that they're receiving uh, a really, uh, uh, you know, real fair pay and good benefits in part because we have high demand and we have a lot of customers that want to do uh, the work that, that that's contemplated in, in this bill. And so we want to be able to both address all the service calls that we might have in any given year, um, and also push into new directions to do installation of those electric heat pump water heaters or, or hybrid heat systems. Um, and uh, so I do think there are, you know, we're, we're large in the state. We do have workforce challenges in nearly every sector. Um, uh, I think that one uh, a positive addition in the uh, in S five is the, is the inclusion of a potential study um, in this bill. A potential study is uh, something that will look at those workforce challenges at, in addition to other um, uh, market conditions that exist and give uh, our regulators and the legislature a picture into what is achievable uh, in the next three, six, nine year term. Uh, potential studies are a real, uh, and, and, and other folks who are here can probably speak to them better than I can, but um, potential studies are a well-known tool in the space of energy efficiency. We do a potential study before each of our, what's called the triennial plan, our three-year plan for energy efficiency that looks at all the things I just mentioned. Um, it gives you a sense of what's possible um, and the potential study that was added in S5 will also help, will also look at the workforce challenges that might exist out there um, so that we can, you know, we can, uh, we can cut the suit to fit our, to, to fit ourselves here uh, around this. And I, I think that's a All right. Um, I know there's a lot of other people with questions, so I want to just remind folks we need, we're bumping up against uh, an hour. We need to take a break before the next speaker. So I'm going to prioritize people who haven't asked questions yet. So Representative Morris. Pat, I'll, I'll go fast too. I'll, I'll try to speak fast too, and okay. maybe I stumble when I do that. I apologize. Um, thanks, Neil, for coming in with the testimony. It's, it's, it's good to hear about your uh, the company and the initiatives that you're undertaking. But I want to drill down a little bit, and, and this might be theoretical. It might not be. Uh, I'm sure you have expectations, but uh, we've had a couple of previous uh, representatives ask you about um, your earning credits now with your installs, or you would be earning would credits be. under this bill right. uh, due to the initiatives that you're undertaking now. And the question was asked is how will they pay you back? And I just wanna put this into a formula. So you're, you're, you're gonna undertake initiatives to reduce the fossil fuel usage, right. but you're gonna be installing alternative initiatives that are kind of like paying for themselves. And so less gas, more cost, I'm just wondering if you have an expectation on what that's going to mean price per unit or measure. Yeah. I, um, so j just to, the first part of your question, you know, these, when, when we are doing um, uh, a lot of the things that I've talked about that what would be qualified as clean heat measures, there is a cost associated with those. Um, by, by doing those early, we are, we are, we, are uh, we, we think that we're ultimately lowering the, the long-term cost to our customers. So by doing them early, trying to take advantage of opportunities right now in the market to, to, um, to do things like the heat pump installation or uh, geothermal or renewable natural gas, et cetera. Um, we are minimizing the cost. We're, we're trying to draw down the most cost-effective credits by doing them early. So there's no, the, the benefits to, to us and to other fuel providers who take advantage of that is by uh, doing things that are creditable later at a lower cost today. Um, and I think that that's a, a key point in this. That's why we are, that's one of the things that this bill would unlock and that's to the benefit, long-term benefit of customers to the extent that we can deliver early action at a lower cost. Um, that means that we're keeping our, our cost down um, for customers. We have a, a lot of, as a, as a, a, a fully regulated established company, we, we believe that we can uh, deliver uh, S5 to our customers in a way that is, um, cost effective. Everybody's experience will be a little different because it a lot of largely depends on on 
um, if you've done some of the installation, uh, done the work on the front end to diversify how you're you're warming your home or, or business. And so importantly, doing early action to help customers make some of these changes early now will future proof them or insulate them against against price volatility in the future that that uh, could come from any from, from any from any quarter. Um, that's why we we're trying to get ahead of it early. I and mean, that's why we've been trying to get ahead of it even without this bill is that we think that that you're going to see that that volatility into the future. And we, we don't want our customers to experience that. So that's why we're moving quickly on this. And that's sort of how the mechanics work inside of it for us. So you don't, I, I'm still not hearing, yeah. do you have an expectation on what the cost might be per unit? Oh, well, I, the, you know, we, we've done some uh, preliminary analysis, but there, you know, as the bills continue to move to the Senate and things change that, you know, I'm not prepared to, to offer, uh, you know, a number on that. I have said that it's not going to be, you know, it's not free. There's a cost to this that will be um, that will be borne by 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 folks involved. Um, we think we can manage that cost and keep it affordable. And ultimately, you know, for people who are able to uh, take advantage early um, uh, to diversify <clears throat> their fuel supply, that that uh, that they'll mitigate any of that increased cost pressure in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Pat. Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, I'm I'm trying to understand as a regulated uh, utility, and I'm trying to, as, as you know, I, I'm trying to distinguish between the world I'm familiar with yes. and, and and Vermont Gas. Um, are there uh, I, I in the in, by statute and and regulatory action, electric utilities are now allowed to spend money on things that they were never allowed to spend money before because they were not, quote, used and useful mm -hmm. in delivering electricity, uh, uh, you know, tier three uh, yes. thing, things like that. Uh, is that an issue uh, uh, for you? I mean, you mentioned a, a, a project that uh, where the PUC turned you down. Uh, are there things that uh, are, um, are, are you, are you subject to the similar kinds of uh, requirements that every everything you spend money on uh, that uh, regulators are going to be approve, uh, approving must be used and useful yes. in delivering your product? Yes, I mean that is <laughs> that is getting you know into the sort of the regulatory weeds of it. Yeah, we need to make sure that we're making prudent investments that are ultimately used and useful to our customers and. Um, uh, by adding additional, like, so the S5 expands the, the types of activities that would be considered prudent and used and useful. Um, okay. And that's very helpful as we work toward um, meeting the state's requirements set forth by the Global Warming Solutions Act. The, and that the, because of S5, the PUC would can consider those as used and useful, whereas the, if five years ago, they might. Might not have. Right. I, I think certainly we're we're seeing uh, you know an evolution across all these sectors as to what we think of as used and useful and, and least cost relative to our goals and uh, the the specificity that S five would bring we believe would uh, give our regulators uh, more ability to help us you know meet both the state's goals and our own goals inside of our regulatory construct. So a different question. Uh, when you talked earlier about uh, uh, different uh, uh, different products that you might be delivering through your pipeline other than natural gas, so when and and I I understand this again from an electric point of view, but if you insert uh, a, a biogas, some amount of biogas into the pipeline somewhere, right. um, uh, it is um, how does that? How do you um, how do you credit that in terms of what the impact is in in in, in Vermont to Vermont yeah. customers? Yeah. So the the um, uh, a couple points there. Uh, first is that the the North American natural gas grid is fully interconnected, so both Canada and the U.S. So um, uh, that that's an important. It's a little different than the the electric grid, whereas they're regional. Um, independent system operators, ISOs that operate with, with limited interconnections between those regions. The gas grid is fully, fully connected. Um, when we think about um, in, in uh, putting in a, a alternative supply like renewable natural gas, biogas, or hydrogen, or in the future, things like syn synthesis gas and other things, is ultimately all um, 
uh, all combustible at the burner tip. That is an important piece of, of, of what we do. Um, anywhere that we are, we are injecting alternative um, supply, it means that we are ultimately using less fossil gas. Um, that, uh, and that is to the benefit of the, the climate and to the benefit of our emissions reduction goals or requirements that we have um, by, by the state. Uh, certainly, we are. We've been prioritizing projects in Vermont around some of those, but we're also looking at some projects out of state where um, that gas is ejected and and displacing our fossil fossil fuel use, our fossil gas use. Okay. The reason I'm asking is because in some ways this is parallel to what a, an electric com company may have a contract with a generating plant that's outside of Vermont. That's right. Um, that's renewable. Yep. Those electrons are not delivered to the outlet in, in right. your home or, or my home, but they get credit for having it. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And I will say, part of your question too, that we take we took a lot of inspiration from what electric utilities have done over the last 20 years and looking at a portfolio approach to diversifying our supply. And if you look at our portfolio, you know, six years ago, it was 100% one thing, which is fossil gas. You know, now it's, it's, 97% fossil gas, but it, but an important, small, but important component of it is, is renewable natural gas. We think over time, we can grow the amount of, of other sources inside of that so that as a portfolio, um, we're bringing the overall carbon emissions down. Ultimately, also important in there is we're going to, because of our energy efficiency efforts, because of our in-home innovation, we're going to need less gas. And we see the amount of gas overall going down so that we take what's left at the end of, of that and diversify it. We're you know, taken together. That's how we achieve our, our, our goals and requirements here. Thank you. Right, Tori, then Logan, and then we need to take Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my question is about supporting uh, lower and middle income customers to do all of the work that it's complicated to get your house yeah. in, in order. Um, is there, I think I saw um, there's a program, a pilot, the Clean Heat Homes. Clean Heat Homes, yes. Are you, are you part of it? Yes, that? yes. Can you tell us a little bit about the financing side? Yeah, I, I mean, I can, I, I can tell you part of the, part of it. I, I'll, try, I'll tell you the parts I don't know. Um, so we, uh, uh, a, 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 a group, a partnership submitted a uh, congressionally directed spending request to Senator Leahy ultimately funded $8.5 million for clean heat homes. And clean heat homes takes a comprehensive approach to, um, uh, to helping low and moderate income Vermonters diversify their energy supply. Doing all the things that I, that I just spoke, spoke about, but doing it in a way that is really seamless to, to the customer. I mean, you identify a really a, a challenge in this space, which is um, these things are fairly complicated. You got to not only are the systems complicated, but you have to you have to talk to the, the energy efficiency person. You got to talk to the boiler person. You got to talk to the you know whatever the other energy systems are. Well, Plenty Homes um, ultimately hopes to to make that fairly seamless. Working with um, Efficiency Vermont, who has you know best in class sort of I, I, uh, uh, practices around. Um, around delivering these kind of results for Vermonters. Ultimately, I think there's a, a appropriation that the governor proposed in front of the legislature that would that would add additional funding um, to this. In the end, that that the federal funding plus any additional state funding helps to to provide sort of the wraparound service to uh, augment and complement uh, things like the weatherization assistance program, any uh, distribution utility. Um, incentives, any any incentives that come out of a clean heat standard, or any other incentives that may uh, the ARPA uh, uh, incentives that have come down from the federal government or the um, IRA. I'm sorry, that's the uh, Inflation Reduction Act incentive. So um, when you with clean heat is kind of think of as the wrapper to help customers really deliver that uh, well. There's also a program Green Saving Green Smart Savings Green Saving Smart that's uh, being led by the um, um, by the by, the WAP uh, agencies that is, is I think will will integrate really well into the clean clean heat homes program, and 
uh, you know, ultimately we're trying to make it as simple as possible for folks to take advantage of this. Um, and, and it's one of the things, one of the reasons we're excited about it. We, we've been working with our customers for decades. Um, they trust us. They know that we're, we're, we're inside their basements fixing stuff. A lot of times people, customers say, wait, we, we left the key under the mat. Just let yourself in and fix it and let us know when it's done. You know, that kind of level of trust means that we can also help them deliver that, not just when they have an emergency, but, but deliver the, uh, the more, more complex work later down the line. Representative Logan. Um, I'm actually just curious about um, a tiny thing, really the potential for biogas. Um, how, how large a market do you, or how much biogas do you think you can use and um, how large of a local market? Yeah, uh, we have studied this, this question. Um, and we think about biogas, we're thinking specifically about renewable natural gas um, in Vermont derived from, uh, you know, principally from farms, could be from wastewater, potentially landfill. Um, farms are, are the best uh, for that uh, and actually get the most, the most stacked benefits starting with the farm. I mean, that's the big benefit comes from helping the farm with their financial economics. Also the environment would run off, but then there's a climate or energy benefit. Um, we've uh, recently completed a study on this and have found that there's about 1.5 BCF, um, which is our you know, unit of, uh, of, of potential statewide renewable natural gas, um, which, is a, which is a really solid amount for us. Um, you know, that's the potential, so we'd be able to deliver less than that. Um, a lot of that is, is uh, you know, near, near to our pipeline, which is pretty helpful in this case. Um, there are certainly other projects that are um, uh, you know, around Vermont and connected to, to, the, to the line that we'd be looking at as well. But in Vermont, that's, that's 1.5 uh, BCF. Um, so, which is a billion cubic feet. Billion cubic feet, yes. Yeah. Um, great. Great. Right. Thank you for your testimony. My pleasure. And if you have, and, and, and thank you for the time. If you have any other questions or would be helpful on anything else, please let us know. Right. Great. Thanks. Thanks. All right, members, we're going to take a break until 10 past. We're going to reconvene our morning meeting with Kyle Landis and Thomas Nauer, uh, both with the Public Utility Commission. Welcome. Thank you for having us. Good morning. My name is Tom Nauer. I'm the Policy Director for the Public Utility Commission. I'm Kyle Landis Marinello. I'm General Counsel at the Public Utility Commission. So we uh, submitted uh, some potential red lines for the committee's uh, consideration. and. It, if it's okay with the, the chair and the rest of the committee, we're just going to use that to kind of guide our testimony, but obviously chime in anytime with any questions that you have. Um, so first off, just a general point that our agency is not taking a position on S5. Uh, the comments and red lines we're providing, the testimony we're providing today is just to show potential improvements to how it could be implemented if the legislature chooses to enact this bill. So yeah, I, the first place we have some suggested edits is in the section about uh, how each obligated party chooses to meet its requirements um, and the, uh, meet the amount of eligible clean heat measures that need to be retired. Um, and it, so this section, I apologize for some formatting issues in this document, but the change we recommend here would be to make it clear that the way that we're expecting people to meet their obligation is through uh, delivery clean heat measures by a designated delivery default delivery agent. And so that uh, designated statewide delivery agent is going to be doing the vast majority of the measures is how we anticipate this will happen. And uh, we want that to be the assumed way of compliance with the clean heat standard. We also have language in here that allows any obligated party to uh, apply to the commission to petition us to meet their obligation through an alternative method, but they would need to do that ahead of time. And we would look at their proposal 
there could be a lot of flexibility built into that proposal in terms of they could say, our plan is to meet it through this amount of a payment to the default delivery agent and this amount of other measures. But if the payment to the default delivery agent ends up being more than the other measures, we might lessen that and we would add these additional measures instead. We'd have some sort of plan ahead of time for how each obligated party meets uh, meets its obligations. So it's a, in some ways a small change, but we think it's a really important one because particularly from an enforcement standpoint, this would make it much easier to implement and enforce if we get to a situation where it appears that some entities haven't actually met their obligation. Just to, um, so in this case, an obligated party, would, let's say we heard from the fuel dealers yesterday, they would be an obligated party. You're imagining that they would be um, meeting the goal by going to one, uh, one person who provides the services to make the transitions or they individually would have to come to you and petition to become um, someone who helped in the transition. Uh, yes, correct. The, um, uh, the bill as passed the Senate has this idea that there will be a statewide, one or more um, statewide default delivery agents. Um, and so we, we really like that idea. Um, the, the change that we're proposing uh, kind of tightens up the requirements for an obligated party to do work on, on its own. Uh, the, the bill as passed the Senate allowed an obligated party to elect out. Um, we think um, it would be better to have the commission um, review a plan by that party in advance and approve it so that we know that the obligated entity has, has thought about it, has the resources, uh, is aware of the market conditions, et cetera. Um, that, that's helpful both for the obligated parties and, frankly, I think for the default delivery agents. It helps them know in advance what is the scope of work that they will be asked to do. Are they doing 10% of the statewide work or 100%? I think that'll just make, make implementation of this uh, a lot cleaner. Representative Sevilla, just along this same line. So the default delivery agent. Uh, I'm envisioning will be utilized probably more by small dealers uh, who are not necessarily providing other clean heat measures to their customers. It's a smaller entity. So they'd just be providing you funding. And what this is saying is you would like that to be the assumption is that everyone will be using the default delivery agent. And then if you are not using the default delivery agent, you'll tell us what your plans are for meeting your obligation, not just saying we're gonna do it our own, but give a little bit more information about how you're going to do it, how you're going to provide clean heat measures. Is that right? That's exactly right. Okay. Yes, and, and I would just add though, it's not just give us more information, it's submit a plan that we have to approve ahead of time. And, and again, a lot of this comes from, um, I've been at the commission about five years now, but before that I spent about eight years at the attorney general's office, mostly doing environmental enforcement cases. And whenever you bring an environmental enforcement case, uh, the other side comes up with a litany of reasons of why they actually did meet whatever requirements they um, uh, are being charged with not meeting. And so when I look at a bill like this, a new program, a whole host of entities that have never interacted with us before, um, you just heard from the one entity that we do interact with on a regular basis, but all the other people being brought in as obligated parties who are not Vermont Gas uh, are new entities to us. And uh, we do have concerns and have from the beginning about compliance and you want as close to 100% compliance as possible. Um, anyone who doesn't comply increases the cost for everyone else. So one of the ways you get Good, a good compliance rate in a new program is to have very clear definitions of who's on the hook. The current bill does exactly that with the definition of obligated party. And we have a comment in here about how we like that definition. We think it's good. And we think this committee should stick with that definition of obligated party. And then second, you have very clear uh, definitions of 
what the obligation is. And so this change here from may obtain the required amount of clean heat credits through and then a list of measures allows for a lot of um, options if someone doesn't meet their obligation to come up with excuses why they didn't meet it. If you implement the change we're suggesting here, it takes all those excuses away. It says you must obtain the amount of clean heat credits through delivery of eligible clean heat measures by the default delivery agent, unless you've gotten prior approval from the commission to do something else. So then if we find it, uh, someone hasn't met their obligation, it's a very simple enforcement action, whether it's in front of us or if it's the attorney general's office going to superior court um, and they just look, okay, are you an obligated party? Yes. Uh, do you have a pre-approved plan to meet this through um, some other measure? No. Did you make a payment to the default delivery agent? No. It's as clear as day that that's enforcement uh, action that they're on the, the hook for to make right uh, for failing to comply. So that's why we're suggesting this approach. We think it's going to simplify both the implementation and the enforcement. Thank you. Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chair. So just help me to try to understand. So the designated statewide delivery agent. What about those fuel dealers, the small dealers that actually go and pick it up and bring it back? What are they considered? And would they have to, in fact, go through that whole process with you individually? So if uh, a fuel dealer is picking up in-state, then um, the in-state entity that imported the fuel at the wholesale level is who has the obligation under this bill. If the fuel dealer is bringing the fuel uh, in from out of state, then they're the importer of the fuels, and so they have the obligation and have to uh, meet the requirement for clean heat credits based on how much fuel they're uh, delivering to Vermont residents. And so under this approach, the way they would meet that requirement is, and I think as Representative Sebelia said, the, the smaller field errors we do expect would meet the requirement through a payment to the default delivery agent. And then the default delivery agent is actually going out and installing the clean heat measures in people's homes. All right, thank you. Um, I have I have a feeling we could probably spend a lot of time on just your first one. Um, how many edit, how many suggestions are in your documents? Yeah, it's not a lot more. This is the biggest okay. change, I would say, but we do have some others that we would Great. like to. Yeah, so awesome. Um, so Representative Pat and then Laura. Yeah, so uh, we had testimony from some fuel dealers yesterday, um, uh, some of whom may be obligated parties or not, based on what, what you were what you were just saying. Uh, but but there are at least some uh, fuel dealers in Vermont now who are, for instance, uh, installing heat pumps. Um, and I, I don't know whether they do that through contractors or their own employees or, or whatever. So they would uh, if uh, they would need to, if they wanted to continue uh, uh, doing that, if they were an obligated party and wanted to continue, they would need to um, basically uh, go to you and uh, and propo propose that, and you would need to take a look at what they do. Is that what I'm... Correct. Okay. And I would just add, if, if they wanted the installation of the measures to be part of how they meet their obligation yes. under this bill, they could also meet their obligation through a payment to the default delivery agent. And then they can simultaneously be a contractor with the default delivery agent to do that work and get paid from the default delivery agent for that. So they would have both those options. Okay. Representative Morris. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and thanks gentlemen for uh, uh, coming in and, and testifying. Uh, can you speak a little bit, it's about, it's about the uh, payments from the smaller dealers. And within the bill, there is a four times penalty if uh, they don't report. Uh, do you have a comment on that? That seems kind of excessive for a small mom and pop dealer that potentially could, the penalty we heard yesterday could be more than what they're, what they're delivering. So it, it, uh, I just wonder if you had, a, you had a sense on whether the four times penalty would uh, 
is appropriate or reasonable. I don't have a comment on that. It's a policy decision for lawmakers. Yeah, and, and the only thing I'll say is that you do increase compliance in terms of getting people to register if there is a bigger penalty. And so there is a, a benefit from that standpoint that, again, one of our big concerns is companies not even registering at all. And um, I believe Mr. Coda has testified to that as well, that that is a, a real concern whenever you're adding an additional cost um, uh, to existing businesses. And so that would be part of the policy considerations taken into account. That's a fair answer. Thanks. Representative Stevens. Thanks, Madam Chair. Have you seen um, program designs that, like, let's say for the first year, have a 1x penalty, 2x two X penalty, uh, and then the penalty increases as the assumption is that businesses become more aware of what they're supposed to be doing. Have you seen that type of program design or? Nothing's coming to mind. Okay. Yeah, I'm not aware of that. Um, so I guess there, I will say there is a benefit to, we have an early registration deadline in here of uh, I think January 31st, 2024. And we think that's an important part of the bill so that we know who are these entities that, again, we're not currently regulate them, regulating them, so we need to know who they are. We're, we're also trying to get their provisions in here to get more information from the tax department. Those are really important provisions so that we can match up, okay, based on the fuel tax that's being paid, here's uh, how many gallons seem to be consumed in Vermont by Vermont residents. Um, and then we're looking at the registrations and seeing, is that the same number or do we have a gap? And that'll be a good early indication of whether everyone who's supposed to register has in fact registered. Um, and so I, I do think there is that worry about how do you get the word out and make sure that it happens. Um, uh, but I, I would hope if if this bill is passed, that there would be an effort to do that early on. And um, these entities aren't currently regulated by us, but they are highly regulated. They do need to be filing tax forms every three months, I believe, on all the gallons that they're selling um, in Vermont, at least at the retail level. And so um, we would know who those entities are based on who's doing those filings. The wholesale entities in Vermont are not currently. Um, paying those taxes because they're done at the retail level. And so we would need to make sure we're capturing who those entities are. But one of the things that's in this bill that's really important is it requires those tax forms to be changed so that the retail providers say who they bought, how much fuel from. And then if they list a wholesaler in Rutland and we look at our list of registrations and don't have that entity registered with us, we know we need to um, uh, get them on board. Thank you. Um, so uh, I give a, this is just a minor change, but um, the definition of a low income customer seems to need some additional language because later on in the bill in 8124D6, there's a reference to customers who qualify for government-sponsored low-income energy subsidy. So it seems like the intent is to group them together in the group of low-income customers, but we think some additional language would be helpful there. Um, as I noted earlier, we do think it's important to keep this clear definition of, of obligated party. Um, just to note that we agree with the Office of Racial Equity about moving the reference to translation services to another section of the bill. Uh, in their comments, they have that spelled out. Um, and then uh, we noticed on the, the temporary suspension it was originally drafted with the not to exceed 18 months put in there, but as the bill developed in the Senate, um, 
they it's moved to three <laughs> cycles uh, for the potential study and um, looking at the, the amount of work that's done a three year period. And so we think if there's going to be a provision like this that allows for a pause, that it would probably make sense for that pause to be for the full three year period. Representative Sevilla. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Kyle, I want to make sure I really grasp this and the <clears throat> interconnection with the other pieces. So if we can even bring this down a little bit more to the near mortal level explanation. Uh, can you walk through that again? Yeah, so this is um, this provision here is uh, actually, I want to interrupt you yeah. for one second for the committee. So this piece here. I have labeled as a circuit breaker. And I think there are two where when something goes awry, we have a chance to stop. We could talk more about that. So I want to understand what you're doing to the circuit breaker here and how it connects to other things. Yeah, I'm glad you interrupted me because I was having trouble thinking of that phrase. <laughs> That's what I was looking for, a circuit breaker. That Yeah, this is a provision that's saying, you know, there are a lot of, unknowns about what the ultimate cost is going to be of um, uh, the clean heat standard. And so when we dive into this, if we're given this um, uh, to implement, uh, we may find that there's good cause to pause uh, the implementation um, until there's a, a larger workforce or there are different reasons given here why a pause might happen. And so if that pause is triggered, then we do think it might make sense to have the, a three-year pause uh, because the entire three-year cycle wouldn't, it would be hard to start halfway through that. I'm, I would like to use a slightly different word rather than pause, I would say maybe throttle down um, because, you know, let, let's say, you know, we, we want to achieve the emissions reduction, the, the full amount of emissions reductions, but a potential study or uh, market factors might indicate it's, it's not technically feasible, it's the workforce isn't there. There might be a number of factors that indicate getting 100% of our goals over the next three years just isn't there. And so we, I'd say, throttle down, you know, to some fraction, 90%, 80%, something like that. Um, I think that's important because I heard pause and I was like, what are we stopping the whole thing? That seems pretty disruptive. Yeah, no, I appreciate that clarification. I'm sorry about that. Representative Stebbins. Thanks, Madam Chair. Do we have a, uh, I, I hear your point. I, I guess I feel like three years is a lot. Is that consistent with our other performance standard programs like the renewable energy standard or it's not quite a performance standard, but the efficiency utility requirements? So off the top of my head, I can't think of anything in statute that sets a specified period um, when we would change. Um, I believe the renewable energy standard law does say on petition of an electric utility, we could change it's it's um, annual obligation. Um, off the top of my head, I don't you know I don't have the red statute memorized, so I couldn't say if it's a temporary amount of time uh, or you know, if there's any temporal element to it. Um, and I'm fairly certain that there's no statutory provision governing um, the energy efficiency obligation. I know that it, if market um, conditions change material within a three or performance period and an efficiency utility could file with the public utility commission and just say hey you know the you know during covid someone could have filed and say we just can't get into people's homes right now or businesses um, and so we need to change what we're doing we thought we'd be doing x we need to do a little bit less than x that option is always on the table for the efficiency utilities representative tory thank you um, what would it look like for you to make that decision? Like what form would that take? It could be that when the Department of Public Service um, files the potential study and we workshop that with stakeholders, it, you know, we might discover that there are very real world conditions that would uh, dictate 
you know, exercising the statutory provision, um, you know, going throttling down, as I using the phrase I used a few minutes ago. And I do think that would be in the form of an order that the commission would issue. Yes, yeah, so the order, the commission operates through rulemaking and through orders, and yeah, um, and there is some. We have some uh, suggested edits later on about when we can use which forms. And uh, I think, but I will put out there that whichever form we use, we are, a, our agency is a creature of statute. And so if we ever do anything that the legislature doesn't like, the legislature can always pass a bill that overrides uh, any decision we've made. And so um, that, that could happen if we issue an order throttling back to let's say 80% and the legislature thinks it should have only throttled back to 90%, then they could always pass a bill that directs us to uh, <coughs> ratchet it back up to a higher level. Um, this is kind of a, just a technical change that on the information the Department of Taxes has to provide us, we realize there isn't a specific deadline in there, so we thought that would be helpful <clears throat> to add that in. Similar change. Representative Bonger. Uh, I'm sorry, can we go back to that uh, the 18 months? Yes. And I'm just noticing, I hadn't focused on this before, but the, the last sentence in that paragraph, um, what if you really had, what if it was COVID and you had to throttle back to 50% or whatever, that actually would materially affect. So is there a, is there a conflict? Yeah, there could be. So this, and just um, so everyone's aware, the reference to 10 BSA section 578, A2 and A3, those are the 2030 and the 2050 requirements under the Global Warming Solutions Act. And so um, I think it's really the A2, the 2030 requirement where this could come into play that if we have a pause in the early state or not pause, a throttling back in the early stages, how much we throttle back would be dependent on whether we think we it can be done and still meet the 2030. And yet if it's not it's feasible, so you, you, I mean, so possibly you could have the conflict where it's not, you determine that for whatever reason, it's not technically feasible and yet, if you do that because it's not technically feasible, it will materially affect. Do we have, is there a conflict in this? I just want to, okay, I just want something we need to look at. That's all I wanted to know. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that is. there is that yeah. possibility. Okay. So, yeah, just on this point. So, this is a place where the potential study is kind of telling us what's possible. And to Representative Bondgard's um, question about COVID. Um, so, you know, we've got the potential study. It's telling us what's possible with regards to the 2030 goals, meeting the 2030 goals, COVID hits. Uh, and one of the many emergency measures that we pass on the floor is, okay, sorry, your targets uh, that were lined up with the potential study on a different set of, you know, in a different world, those need to be ratcheted down. So that's an emergency measure that could further ratchet that down. Yes? Yes, I, and I think that likely is what would happen if we found ourselves in that situation that we would come to the legislature and say, something needs to give. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. As, it, as this is written, it is clear that any ratcheting down that we make cannot materially affect um, the ability to meet those Global Warming Solutions Act requirements. Um, so I mentioned these are just technical changes on the deadlines for the tax department. Um, this is the provision I referenced earlier where we have in here that if a, a customer qualifies for a government-sponsored low-income energy subsidy, then those Say what page? Oh, page you, yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, that those per, if clean heat measures would uh, 
qualify as being delivered to low-income customers if they qualify for a government-sponsored um, <coughs> subsidy. Uh, so now page 17. These are these changes are related to uh, what we testified about earlier about instead of allowing the obligated party to elect how it's going to meet the requirements, um, they would need to get approved in advance uh, what their their plan is. And we do anticipate that the larger entities like Vermont Gas, um, some of the larger wholesale entities that are obligated parties are likely to file a petition with us to ask for uh, meeting the requirement in a different way. Um, and the smaller entities are more likely to make a payment to the default delivery agent. Um, and some of this too, and, and uh, you'll hear after us from uh, a representative from Efficiency Vermont, which may uh, yeah, be one of the designated default delivery agents. Um, whoever is in that role needs to know how many uh, heat pumps, weatherizations, uh, additional work they need to do to um, meet whatever is being asked of them. And so we have something in here about whenever we, we would approve a plan for an alternative way of meeting the clean heat standard, um, the designated default delivery agent or agents would be informed of that and uh, uh, told that you're not going to be getting a payment from this entity because they're doing renewable natural gas or some other method of compliance in whole or in part. I'll, I'll talk about this note. This um, is where the commission is setting the uh, cost per credit that an obligated entity would pay to the default delivery agent. And right now the bill um, has the commission providing not less than 120 days notice of that credit cost to obligated entities. And th there's a bit of tension here. So I don't, you know, we don't have a, we, we could live with 120 days. Um, it, it allows obligated entities some time to think about, you know, what's the best business case for me? Is it to do the work on my own? Is it to work with the default delivery agent? Is it to go to the market? Um, but the consequence of giving 120 days is that really we might be setting the uh, credit cost on stale information um, because in, in practice we'll be um, using cost data um, you know, at the end of one year to set the per credit cost two years in advance. Um, so if, if, if the 120 days were shortened in the bill, or if it allowed the commission to short that, um, shorten that if the commission found that it would provide better data to the obligated entities and to the default delivery agent, I think that might be helpful. Before we move on from this page, back in the, uh, in the blue, if you will, um, in the plan, what's the standard of review for the plan? I'm sorry, say that again. Uh, the obligated party submits a plan yep. to not have to pay into the full. Uh, what's the what's the standard of review? Is it reasonable the standard? I think that uh, we would essentially be looking at okay, what is their obligation? How many gallons of what type of fuel are they delivering? And we would be looking at their plan for how to meet the credits. Uh, the tag would be in the uh, technical advisory would be informing us on which measures cause what reductions. And so um, instead of thinking about in terms of a, a standard, I would think about almost as a mathematical exercise that we would be looking at, okay, this is what uh, reduction they need to meet. And uh, here are the measures they've proposed that has to line up and actually cause the reduction if they're substituting payments to the default delivery agent with some other method of compliance. Would you also be looking at and considering whether you believe they have the ability to do what's in the plan? Yes, that would be something we'd look at as well. That be 
a reasonableness standard when you're looking at that portion of the yeah i think that's a fair way to characterize it yeah i think the details of that review we would work out you know in the engagement process that that we could be conducting in the next 18 months um, it is important to establish what what are we reviewing when when those plans are submitted and so the parties know in advance what is <laughs> And I should mention also that, I said, we do things in two different ways through rulemaking and through orders. Um, whenever we issue an order, it is subject to appeal uh, to the Vermont Supreme Court by any party that's adversely affected by it. And so um, there is always that check on there that if someone submitted a plan and we rejected it and they disagree with the rationale for our rejection, then there could be an appeal mechanism available to them there. Um, Tom, do you want to mention this one? Sure. Um, I'm recommending the insertion of the words at least. Um, and basically this is, you know, we're, we're commencing a proceeding potentially in a few months from now um, and working at a breakneck pace uh, for a year and a half uh, to get this thing up and running. Um, and the bill currently has us um, opening a proceeding at least every three years, or every three years, um, to establish the per credit cost. And uh, me at the commission and everyone who's involved, uh, we're likely to have some learning in the course of the first year or two. Um, so it may be. Uh, advisable to have us um, open a proceeding sooner than three years um, from the commencement date um, to update that credit cost. You'll see, I mean, I think a lot of these changes are aimed at giving us more flexibility because, uh, so in my role as general counsel, one of the things I do is advise the um, commissioners on what we're allowed to do and what we're not allowed to do. And as I said, we're a creature of statute, so we can't do something, we can't do it. Even if every single stakeholder comes to us and says, hey, we need to update this. As the bill's written now, we look and say, ah, it says every three years. But if you had the words at least every three years, um, then we have that flexibility to do that, if it makes sense. Um, so now we're into the rulemaking section, and uh, I, I think some of the changes we're suggesting here are the result of um, it, the way that the bill moved through the Senate, that there were some changes um, uh, after it left Senate Natural Resources, and um, uh, some of those that led to some I don't know if I want to say inconsistency, but it, it's a, some tension between some of the different sections. And this is one where um, we do think there was kind of a broad-based um, checkback provision that was added in the Senate. Uh, and we have some comments on that later on, but the way it's worded, it, it might actually preclude us from issuing orders at all during the interim period. And so, um, uh, and it could also prevent us from changing the rules down the road again, even when all of the stakeholders come to us and say, we need a tweak to the, the rules. Um, so this is just making clear that um, we can issue orders or take other actions even if there's a requirement for legislative approval before the actual standard goes into effect. Um, so again, this is a policy decision. If the policy decision is we can't do that, um, legislature obviously can do that, but then it's gonna raise a lot of questions. Like if <clears throat> January 31st of 2024, no one registers with us, we can't do anything about it. And uh, so, I think having some flexibility to be able to, for instance, start an enforcement action or start or go to the attorney general's office, ask them to bring an enforcement action against entities that clearly are delivering fuel but haven't registered. Um, all that would be put on pause if 
the current version is is passed that or at least that would be one interpretation of it and we we don't think that was the intent of the senate it could be that was but that's that's not the sense we have from uh, our understanding of that provision Okay, we're almost at the end here. This is a related uh, change that um, in the rulemaking authority, this provision was added um, on the Senate side after it had left uh, the Senate Natural Resources Committee. And we got to it said, currently says shall not file proposed rules with the Secretary of State or issue any orders implementing the clean heat standard without specific authorization acted by the General Assembly. So at a minimum, we recommend scratching the phrase or issue any orders. And then um, we also just have a, a general comment on that approach. And um, mm -hmm. so we've raised three overall concerns with it. Um, so the first one is if we don't have the authority to go forward with the clean heat standard, uh, and that could be a barrier to getting full and active participation by all of the stakeholders in the rulemaking process. Um, and we we also just have a concern about we're, we're hiring three new people to help us with this program. And there's funding in there for that, and we greatly appreciate that. And we hope that nothing changes about that part of the bill because we're a small agency. We're 25, including the three commissioners. So we need three new people to help with this new program. But our ability to attract the best talent uh, to fill those positions could be impacted when the there are questions about whether the program will ever actually go into effect and questions about the long-term funding. Um, Right now, there's funding for one year for those positions, but um, and a proposal we come back to the legislature for, to look at long term funding. Uh, but the long term funding isn't there now. Um, we asked the Senate for the long term funding to be in this bill, and it, it, it didn't happen. Um, so, a second concern is uh, just about setting a precedent of going forward with a full rulemaking process and then needing to come back to the legislature for that approval. It, it's a big deviation from the well-established Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules process. Um, so just a concern, does that become the norm for rulemaking at our agency or others? And then uh, the third thing is just the, we have a concern about the uncertainty over what our authority is in the meanwhile. So I gave one example of if entities fail to register, it's not clear if we can do anything about that. So um, as I mentioned before, I have a background in enforcement. Uh, if, if you really don't want people to do what you're asking them to do, don't give the regulatory authority any ability to do anything about it when they fail to comply. And so um, again, a minimum, if this type of check back provision stays in place, we would want it changed so that it's clear we can issue orders in the meanwhile, even if the standard itself can't go into effect. Yeah, so does the issue, does that, does that alleviate this concern or it's still there, your concern, if we make the changes proposed earlier around the issuing of orders? Uh, it, it, it goes a long ways toward alleviating uh, some of these concerns that we've raised. Uh, it still leaves a lot of uncertainty out there that I think is going to impact how much um, full participation, active participation we get from all the stakeholders when we're doing the, the rulemaking process. Along the lines of my question, Representative Sebelius. Yeah. I mean, seven. <laughs> uh oh. Um, <laughs> I have to take a deep breath. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, 
do you have some suggestion, uh, you know, if typically what it is is rulemaking and then it goes to LCAR mm -hmm. and what this is um, proposing is essentially a, a legislative approval, do you have some other suggestion that might meet in the middle there? I think that's what the original version of S5, as it was introduced um, this session, was attempting to do where we'd have to file the rules January 15th of 2025 with the legislature. But there's a, a pause, and, and this is a true pause, not a <laughs> throttling back. We couldn't file it with the Secretary of State till July 1. And so that gives the legislature a full session to look at, OK, here's what the commission is proposing. Um, are we going to step in and, and stop that? Um, again, I, I will mention the legislature always has that authority. And so that's why I think you have the LCAR process um, where, you know, the, the way that works is at the end of the day, the, an agency can go forward with a rule, even if there's an objection by LCAR. Um, I only aware of one time when that's ever happened. And I think it was an kind of an emergency circumstance and unique circumstances. Um, generally, if LCAR is objecting to a bill, it's enormous pressure on the agency to change it and address LCAR's objections. Because if the agency goes forward with a bill that LCAR is objected to, then anyone can challenge that in court and the presumption of validity <laughs> that a rule normally has is out the window. Um, and with a program like this, there's significant uh, moneyed interest that would likely challenge something like that. And uh, they would have no present, there'd be no presumption of validity that rule. Yes, we could go forward with it. But at the end of the day, uh, it's probably not likely to survive a court challenge if that happens. So we do think there's that type of check back already through the LCAR process. There's the ability of the legislature to step in at any point and stop us from doing anything that we're doing if uh, we're going in a direction the legislature didn't want us to go in. Um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, this is a, a balancing act where um, this is a first in the nation program. There's gonna be a lot to figure out. We're gonna need to hear from all the stakeholders about um, how to make this work. And we're gonna need a lot of flexibility in how to implement it. And um, the more the legislature is getting involved after that process has started, the more that can impact our ability to actually go forward and, and do what we think is the, the best program we can do. And, and we have, very talented people at the commission. Uh, they take very seriously um, <clears throat> meeting any statutory requirements that are put on us and looking at legislative intent and implementing legislative intent. And so that's what we would be doing if we're given this program. And, uh, and if we ever strayed from that, there are a lot of checks in place where the legislature could step in and change course or stop us at any moment. Yeah, um, I, I'm curious if the timeline in the bill is introduced, rules can often take more time than we imagine. Um, is it a realistic timeline if we, if we did go back to the original timeline and then you had to submit by January 1 and then there was that pause of six months, could you realistically meet that January 1 deadline in the original bill? Um, it's a, it, I think it was, yeah, January 15th was the deadline and um, we would be using those additional 14 days. <laughs> so it would be right up to the wire for sure. I mean, it is a very tight schedule as it is, um, but we would, we would meet that deadline uh, or, or make every effort. And if we thought we couldn't meet it, then we'd come to the legislature and say we needed a, a change. Representative Sebelia. Yeah, so there's been some concern that I have heard um, about the legislature being presented as part of this process that we've configured together, a final rule to vote on 
that if we don't like, there's nothing we can do about. So then the legislature can't <coughs> make changes. And you know, I've been working with Ledge Council to better understand that. I don't believe that that's the case. I believe there are actually a lot of options for the legislature when the final rule comes, if we don't like it. Can you tell us what, uh, what options are available in this check back scenario with the legislature when the rule comes, if the legislature does not like what they say? Sure. So um, if the bill as it came out of the Senate is what's there, then um, that's interesting. That could actually create some restrictions. The way it's written now, the bill is saying that rule that we propose can't be finalized until there's an approval of the legislature. Um, I haven't fully thought through what that means. I've been focused more on S5 as, as it was introduced with the January 15th proposal. And if, if the language went back to that, where we would be able to go ahead and file on July 1st, 2025, unless the legislature steps in, in the meanwhile, we give the legislature, here's the final rule on January 15th, um, the legislature could pass a one-line bill that says, uh, notwithstanding these other provisions, the commission shall not file that, uh, go forward with the clean heat standard and the whole program is dead. So it has that option. Um, it can do nothing. And then we would go forward and do the rules. Uh, and I, I would not recommend the legislature does this because again, this goes to a process concern, a kind of um, precedent concern of rules going before the entire legislature to be tweaked. Uh, but I do think under the S5 as it's introduced, the legislature could easily craft a bill that says um, uh, any rules filed by the commission with the secretary of state regarding the clean heat standard um, may not include the following or must include the following and give us changes that would need to happen to that rule. And then that might mean under the Administrative Procedure Act, we'd have to restart the process. Although again, the legislature could say, uh, notwithstanding the Administrative Procedure Act, they can go forward with these rules as long as the following changes are made. The Administrative Procedure Act is a default provision. The legislature can change those requirements at any time. So under S5, as it was introduced, I do think there would be a lot of flexibility in how the legislature addresses the rules that they're handed. But again, um, we, we wouldn't recommend going that route and what you would hear from the commission uh, two years from now, whether it's Tom and me or other people in these seats, is that this was a long process with a lot of stakeholders lots of the pieces fit together in ways that uh, the legislature might not fully understand having not gone through that long rulemaking process. And so I think the strong preference would be a kind of up or down vote if the legislature were looking at that uh, two years from now. One other question, just can you talk about, um, I believe the process that we would be faced with looking at is you present us with a rule, we would have to vote. And then, then it would go to LCAR, which is also kind of a weird thing. But I think that's the process that we have in here that the Senate sent us. The, the process the Senate sent, yes, does require a vote. But I'm sorry, you said, and then it would go to LCAR? Yes. So it would not go to LCAR before the vote. It would go to LCAR after the vote. I believe um, that's the case. Yeah, that, that may be. Uh, it does seem uh, it's not entirely clear why the LCAR process would be needed if the whole legislature has approved it. And so um, it might be if that provision stays there that it would make sense to say that the other provisions, the Administrative Procedure Act, wouldn't need to be required at that point. Okay, thank you. Maybe all that we had.
um, this is just another place we've flagged where the reference to um, specific authorization by the General Assembly has been added. Um, and this is what I referenced earlier about um, how the uh, uh, clean heat standard rulemaking provisions, um, if earlier in the, uh, in the bill, there's an ability that we would have to propose rules that would go through the normal rulemaking process that would allow amendments to those same rules to be done outside of the normal rulemaking process. And that's in provisions, section 8126 C and D. And yeah, I, there's other checks and balances that are put in place in those sections where we would have notice and comment. There'd be an ability for anyone to challenge a change to the rule at the um, Vermont Supreme Court if they thought the rule change didn't make any sense. Uh, but if 8126 C and D remain, and we think those are important provisions, then we think this is an important uh, change to make in this section. And just to back up for a second, the reason the Senate had it in that flexibility to the rulemaking to have an alternative process for amending those rules is uh, because as Tom and I both mentioned, this is a first in the nation program, we're going to be learning a lot as it goes on if we're given this task. And we don't wanna be in the situation of all of the stakeholders telling us, hey, we thought that rule would work as it was, but now we need this slight change and our hands are tied. We need to go through the um, lengthy rulemaking process to get a change made and it can't go into effect uh, right when we need it to. And so, there's some flexibility built in there, but to actually have that flexibility, we need this change as well. And then just some uh, uh, one month additional time to um, propose suggested revenue streams so that that date lines up with on the next page, there's a report to the um, committees of jurisdiction due on February 15th, 2024. So that covers it. Thank you for that uh, substantive testimony. Representative Morris. Thank you, Madam Chair. Quick question. Regarding the guardrail uh, coming back to the legislature, uh, once the plan is designed before it's implemented, um, and I may miss speak a little bit I, 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 and I, I understand that you have concerns for constituents as well or uh, customers but I think this was put in because if the plan comes back and the price per unit measure of the fossil fuel and the credits that would be paid the level of credits whether it's 50 percent 90 percent for installations which I think is part of the, the charge here um, <coughs> just comes back and it's enormous. We have to answer to constituents and customers. You don't necessarily, the PUC doesn't necessarily answer to the customers. You have a charge to meet a goal. <clears throat> I, so I think that's why the guardrail was, was put in there. And I don't know if you have a comment on that. I didn't misspeak and I, I don't mean to, to be insulting at all. You guys have a, an enormous responsibility if this thing was to pass. So and it's appreciated. Just concern that if this comes back and it becomes undoable in a lot of customers' minds, you know, we have to answer to that. So uh, the guardrail was put in, I believe, for that reason that we wanted to have the opportunity to speak. I don't know what the result would be if uh, if we didn't approve the plan and what we would do to go back, but obviously we'd have to make some adjustments to something, either the goals amount of reductions or some something but we're also bound by statute that, that we implemented a few years ago that we need to do this i don't know if i'm if i if that point's clear or if you have a comment uh, <clears throat> suggesting we remove the guardrail is that what i'm hearing uh the guardrail of the check back, the, the check back with the legislature um we don't have a a policy position on that. Um, we just do have concerns with um, how it's drafted in the precedent that 
sets. And so, um, you know, over the next two years, I think we would get a lot more clarity on what the costs are actually going to be. And so, uh, as I said before, the legislature always has the ability to step in at any point and, um, you know, this bill could be changed to put some sort of a, another uh, circuit breaker in there. If the costs were above a certain amount, then we can't go forward. Um, that's there's precedent for doing that. Um, or uh, the legislature, I'm sure, would hear from it from constituents if the price is going to be more than what was anticipated. And the legislature, as I said, can pass a very simple bill, one sentence that says. Public Utility Commission shall not implement the clean heat standard and um, everything stopped in its tracks. And so those are the types of guardrails that are more common, that there's more precedent for that and that don't raise these same concerns that we have over um, how S5 is now. But as I said, we don't have a policy position at the end of the day on whether to do it this way or a different way. Thank you. And I know you have a question, but I'm just going to follow up real quick. The precedent that exists for the cap is where? Um, um, do you know what, examples? What, what example would be in the renewable energy standard? There's a concept called the alternative compliance payment, and that kind of sets the ceiling on what a an electric utility would pay for a you know, credit of compliance um, for renewable electricity. Um, so that really sets the goal of uh, we're going to, you know, they want to do work um, or procure credits at a lower cost. Um, but there's a ceiling that says, you know, this is the maximum amount that you will pay to comply. Thank you. Representative Sabine. <clears throat> to Representative Morris's question, um, when we passed uh, 715 last year, which was the original version of the clean heat standard prior to improvements that I think have been made, uh, we heard concerns about uh, the legislature uh, needing to be needing to be more um, active in the authorization of it. But as we've heard from the PUC, we just have to do our jobs. Uh, you know, like if there's a problem, we can walk in, introduce a bill and uh, say, we don't like this. We want to change this. We want to stop this. Uh, we could, we can already do that. Uh, and that need last year was expressed by the governor. Um, the Senate actually put in uh, the check back provision, a check back provision, which we ultimately agreed to and voted on last year. So a check back provision so that we would have to look at, you know, the work uh, and then take an affirmative vote. And the bill was still vetoed last year. Um, so this uh, was that was taken into consideration in the drafts that were brought forward this year in that there was this pause that we've heard discussed that was proposed as part of the original S5 and the bill that we have on our wall. So that the rulemaking, all of that would come, and it would, January, would, there'd be a pause. Uh, and that pause would allow us to do our jobs. So we could be concerned and pass uh, legislation to address those concerns, or we could not be concerned. And not, um, again, <clears throat> the Senate, has added in this check back to make sure that we do do our jobs. Um, and I, I mean, I, that's my interpretation of what's going on here. I hear the PUC saying, uh, when you add in additional guardrails to make sure that you do your job, it does create some challenge for us in trying to give you what you've asked for. So with this, that's what I think I've heard today with this check back piece. And I have some sympathy for that. Um, nonetheless, it's what the Senate has sent us twice. Thank you for your testimony. Great, we're gonna reconvene our meeting and um, our next witness is David Westman with the Efficiency Vermont, welcome. Thank you, good morning. Um, yes, for the record, my name is Dave Westman. I'm the Director of Regulatory and State Agency Affairs for Efficiency Vermont. 
Um, in my role at Efficiency Vermont, I often engage a lot with the Public Utility Commission and the stakeholders who work in that department. We have a lot of uh, technical and regulatory proceedings and matters that would need to be uh, worked through um, if the legislature were to pass um, the Clean Heat Standard, uh, the Affordable Heat Act. And so my role here today is to identify um, you know, as an existing entity with an order of appointment with the Public Utility Commission, uh, what a process would look like and offer some um, friendly suggestions for how um, the current bill as it stands might be improved and in specific sections. And um, specifically, I wanna, I wanna just preface my remarks by saying, uh, you know, our focus in looking at the Affordable Heat Act is um, its capacity to bring uh, additional weatherization projects uh, to the state of Vermont. And that tremendous value proposition that weatherization has, not just for greenhouse gas reductions, but <clears throat> energy reductions, savings, and as um, uh, uh, Neil pointed out this morning, uh, just overall benefits to households is, is really important. So we are very much thinking about the Affordable Heat Act as uh, in the context of how can it bring additional weatherization to our state. And on that point, I'll have about four recommendations that I'll walk you through. The first is around um, clarity uh, of timelines and um, awareness of parallel paths and interrelated processes. Um, there is a significant amount of regulatory activity uh, as, uh, as Tom and Kyle just alluded to, uh, several years worth of work actually. And we counted about four different uh, parallel paths that would all be taking place uh, simultaneously. Uh, those paths involve the PUC rulemaking and the market formation, which we were just alluding to with the uh, uh, with what the check back provision will be specific to, um, but also the creation of the technical advisory group, the equity advisory group, and the default delivery agent appointment and the DPS potential study. Um, so that's a significant amount of work that is possible, um, but what we would really like to see is a clear timeline with how um, all of those are to be rolled out. And specifically, uh, we think in a lot of these proceedings, it's very helpful to work backwards in time. And so um, one of the things that we would be thinking about is when would the first retirement of credits actually take place? And if you put that into the perspective of the current efficiency utility, uh, we claim energy efficiency savings from the prior calendar year in April of the next calendar. So if you are anticipating that projects and are, are completed and fuel is accounted for in the year 2026, then it would be helpful for the legislation to be clear that the first compliance date would be April 2027, as far as when those first credits are retired. The second point of clarification would be when the default delivery agent should be appointed. Uh, we, uh, as the entity administering Efficiency Vermont, uh, take about 18 months uh, to work through the process of uh, both developing a plan, sharing it with stakeholders, and then ultimately uh, taking it in front of the commission uh, under uh, largely uh, contested case proceedings uh, to then have that plan be approved. Uh, so that is a significant amount of time. Uh, I know that Ledge Council has provided you a uh, calendar that identified the default delivery agent should be appointed sometime in February of uh, 2024. Uh, that seems like a workable date from my perspective um, when we sort of start, started working that calendar backwards, but I just wanted to point out it's not in the bill. And so if that is the intent of the committee to have the default delivery agent approved uh, before, say, the checkback provision, um, dates like that would be very helpful and illuminating as far as how these regulatory processes would all play out. Okay. Now my second recommendation, uh, this actually has uh, to do with one of the um, one of the topics that the PUC was just referring to, actually, which is the uh, extension of the waiver provision from uh, currently written at 18 months to 36 months. Um, yes, we agree with that. Uh, 36 months would be our recommendation because it's the three year period that a DDA default delivery agent would be expected to implement programs under. And uh, for the same reason that um, uh, Kyle and Tom just pointed out is that it would be really hard to have to readjust in the middle of a three-year performance period. So I think that syncs up nicely. Uh, a further clarification, and also what um, 
uh, uh, Representative Sibeli, you were referring to is the potential study. Right now, um, that opportunity for a waiver is um, limited to, uh, let me just check my notes, but the, 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 the opportunity for the waiver is um, a shortage of clean heat credits or undue adverse financial impacts on particular customers. We would add to that uh, market conditions as identified by the potential study. Um, that potential study is a really important indicator of exactly what is available uh, for a default delivery agent to provide. Uh, if we were thinking about this in the terms of weatherization, uh, we would be looking at a potential study that says exactly how much weatherization is available in the market, what can the workforce bear, and how much would it cost. And uh, if, if the goals are set above what the potential study says is achievable, then that is obviously putting the default delivery agent in a very complicated situation. Representative Sevilla. Thanks for your testimony this morning, Dave. And I, I'm hoping that you will have some of this maybe in writing or some dates that we can refer to as we're working. Yeah, we can, we can provide that. Can you talk just a little bit more um, about the um, existing potential studies yeah. and the types of um, the types of measures, um, is that the word that I want? Um, yes, measures uh, that might be used to measure potential. Um, and have you thought about that in light of this? Yes, absolutely. Um, so in perspective, we do an electric potential study whenever the EEU, Efficiency Vermont, is going in for its three-year triennial plan. A potential study is done by a third party contracted through the Department of Public Service, and they look at what is technically available, uh, market achievable, and program achievable. So those are three different levels of technical potential. So I'll talk about the first one. Technical potential is essentially a state of the market. How many opportunities in total are there in the state to Let's talk about weatherization. How many homes can be weatherized? How many old heating systems can be converted? Uh, what is the total max capacity for the state to turn this over? We have not done that on a statewide level for the entire thermal sector. And the reason why is because there's always been a limiting factor to the Efficiency Vermont thermal efficiency budget by the TEPF budget itself. And so very, you know, these, these potential studies do have a cost. And so we have not ever done that technical potential for the entire state. We've done it, the department has done it for the BGS territory because they're an EEU and they're providing those services. But we have not done it for the entire state. So that's the first thing. Then the, then the, next, then the next level down would be, what is the market actually willing to bear? Not everyone is going to accept contractor in their home. Not everyone is going to accept that my heating unit needs to be replaced. That's called the market. That's called the market achievable. That's essentially if you, if in a perfect world, you were giving a hundred percent incentives, how much could you realistically move the market? And I mean, these are spread out over time as well. This is, you know, 10, 20 years worth of activities. And so that's an important indicator because not everyone's going to participate um, in the, in these programs. And so we kind of have to take that into effect. And then the next level, and this is sort of where things like budget planning and incentive levels start getting into consideration. That's called the program achievable. And the program achievable is essentially what can you do with a realistic budget? And more, most importantly, I think, what can the workforce actually implement? And all of those are sort of downward pressure on total projects that you can do in a given year. And so for all of those reasons, we think it's very important that the PC be able to take feedback from that potential study into consideration for this waiver and extend that for potentially the whole three years um, if, if our suggestion is taken, because that would then give the, the default delivery agent the opportunity to do workforce development, get more workers in the field, implement things like apprenticeship programs, training programs, and build that capacity so that you can actually raise that program achievable to something that is both uh, workable from the workforce, but also affordable. That's really helpful. Thank you. Representative Sackowitz. 
do you, you have a, any data on how good these potential studies that have been done in the past are? Like how, how accurately do, do they tend to, to get it? A good potential study will look at what has been achieved over the last five to 10 years and use that as a barometer for um, these, these three levels. Um, in various constructs, yeah, I think they're pretty accurate. And to that point, Efficiency Vermont um, will work with the contractor that the department hires to do this third-party evaluation. Sometimes we'll agree to disagree, but largely we're looking at the same inputs and outputs and trying to see things in a, in a similar way. And as the practitioner of efficiency services, we have a pretty good sense of what the market can bear based on various incentive levels and program costs. And so um, generally speaking, and if this, we're actually in the middle of this right now, um, our, the third party contractor the department hired and what our perspective of what the market can bear with is within two to 3% of each other. So, so, so when you look back at previous potential studies and say, how well did they get it right? They, they, they do a pretty good job is what you're I would I would characterize it as pretty good without actually having some of those lines in front of me. The thing that will always throw it off is um, changes in um, changes in baseline. Baseline, it means like if legislation passes, for example, last year we phased out four foot linear fluorescent bulbs um, by act of the legislature that was not in the previous potential study. And so that changed the results of this potential study that we had to complete this year. And so things like that will change the results all the time. Mm -hmm. and so do previous potential studies inform future potential studies that are created? Like you sort of learn lessons of how well they worked in the past? And I would say so, yes. Um, the, 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 for example, the contractor that the department hired this round uh, was the same that, that was hired in the previous round. And they're going off of, you know, they're building off of their assumptions from the previous potential study. And the studies that we're talking about in this bill be for the thermal sector would, would be there would be new ones that hadn't been done before so there would be we would have less certainty perhaps in terms of how, how accurate they are likely to be than we would if if we had had more of a track. i think we would look very carefully at the accuracy of the projections yes that's a fair statement okay Thank you, <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'm trying to find the exact numbers, and I'm not going to find the exact numbers, but um, Secretary Moore provided us some really valuable testimony um, looking at the Pathways report and what the numbers yeah. were of measures that would be needed yes. to uh, hit the 2030 uh, numbers uh, for the Global Warming Solutions Act. Uh, which of course requires us to make reasonable progress towards the goal yes. statute. So with those measures, do you, you, do you know the measures that I'm speaking about that were in the Pathways Report? Uh, yeah, I'm broadly familiar with the Pathways Report as well as the department's um, um, clean energy uh, plan. Yeah. So how might a potential study work with those numbers and in a very specific Vermont space? Yeah. Um, I've seen potential studies like that um, introduce a fourth category of a policy uh, option, which is to achieve the policy goals. Um, these are the measures that would need to be implemented, and this is a reasonable estimate for how much it costs. That would be a relatively straightforward inclusion in the RFP that goes out to that potential study is to essentially have that, have that GWSA um, be one of the uh, key outcomes. And I believe the Clean Energy Plan did something very similar in its um, in its multiple iterations of um, potential. So the report gave us, and again, I'm not going to be able to call it up right now, very specific numbers about the number of heat pumps we might need, yeah. the number of homes that we need to weatherize in order to meet the 2030 goals. That's right. And so how can a potential study help us think about those numbers and our goals. Absolutely. A potential study will develop numbers of heat measures that are installed in all of those categories of technical potential, market achievable, and program achievable. Okay. And so you will get very specific numbers about heat pumps, homes weatherized, MMBTUs saved. We'd make estimates about wood heat installed, oil, 
switched over to electric, all of those things would be part of the potential study. So if our statutory goal and the pathways report says, I'm going to now make a number up, um, we need to install 50,000 heat pumps by 2030, pathways report to yep. the goal, potential study will come in and say, well, here's actually, this is what I think is going to happen. Here's actually the potential to hit that 50,000 goal. Here's with your workforce, your budget, right. uh, the compliance, willingness out amongst the people, yep. um, those types of things. Here's what you have the potential to hit as right. opposed to the 50,000. Yeah, there could be there could be a gap between the beat not as opposed as a gap. Right. There, there could be a gap between those those numbers, which is why we think it's appropriate to have the, the 36 month waiver offer off on the table for the PUC to take a look at that number and say this is what the market can reasonably bear. We want we want to direct the the, the DDA to invest in workforce, invest in whatever that potential study says is the limiting factor, really. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that there is a potential for a gap there. And that's what this would hopefully rectify is that we could get things back on track in a relatively short order, rather than just permanently living with that sort of lower performance. Helps us understand what the slope is of achievement. Being. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Representative Tory. Good question. Thank you, Dave. How well do we know how old our are? I would say with a <laughs> with a with a fair level of understanding, um, the department does do market characterization studies, and so we do have a pretty good sense of um, what's out there. And so that's what a potential study would very much start with is they would take a look at those existing reports that have been done. Those would largely just be evaluators that have sort of come and gone through homes doing inventories of like what's there. Now, granted, a lot of that has actually been for the new construction uh, sector. And so we don't have a lot of detail about say a hundred, how many hundred year old farmhouses uh, are still burning oil. That would be a guess, um, but potentially, if that is necessary after sort of evaluation of the current materials that are available, you could add that as a, you know, to a potential study to say you want a market evaluation to be part of that. If in development of say a technical achieve, achievable number. Great questions. Hey, should I uh, proceed? Um, the uh, the other point that I wanted to raise, my third recommendation, is that um, the uh, Affordable Heat Act uh, should recognize through clean heat credits all of the market activities that support clean heat measures, um, and not just incentives. And and what I'm referring to there is actually a very sort of relevant point to what we were just talking about. Is that should the potential study come back and say? you need twice as much workforce in order to meet the GDWSA goals, that means we need to invest in the workforce. That means we need to spend money on apprenticeship programs, training programs, and business development courses for folks who are running weatherization type businesses. All of that is work that Efficiency Vermont currently does in the electric sector and to a, a, a lesser degree in the weatherization space. We have an efficiency excellence network of uh, over 100 contractors across the state who work with us, go to our trainings, receive certifications, and essentially build their technical potential. So if you need to do that for weatherization and incentivize 75 to 90% of the cost of the project on top of all of that training and work, there are costs there that are totally invisible to the homeowner or the clean heat market. And um, our recommendation is that the technical advisory group um, take those costs and take those expenses and efforts into account in assigning or identifying a methodology for how credits ought to be allocated. And that is a very new thing uh, that the TAG has never done before. And so that's why I'm bringing it to you as a legislative recommendation is that normally the tag will just say, this is how much a measure will save in energy. Thank you very much. Let's 
let, please don't ask us anything more on that. Here we're actually saying, well, there's a huge market out there that led to the installation of that measure and costs that were assigned to it. And so if you don't recognize those investments, you're potentially undermining uh, the full value of that. We don't think that you can just put 75, 90% project cost incentives on the table and achieve all of those goals. You need to train people how to install it and you need to train people uh, how to do it properly. And so that is, and you need to hire new people potentially. And so all of that requires effort. Representative Stebbins. Thanks, Madam Chair. On the one hand, I understand that. On the other hand, I don't know why we should be treating it differently. Um, when we go through a tag process right now, um, you're looking at uh, what the savings potential is from a heat pump if it's used a certain number of hours, certain proportion of the season. Um, it's still a heat pump. I, I guess I'm I'm kind of trying to figure out why the, the technology isn't necessarily different. So why, why you're making yeah. this recommendation? This is about assignment of credits. And um, there's a lot of existing entities in the field and in the space right now, existing programs. For example, Efficiency Vermont's thermal efficiency programs will still be in place. We are still receiving revenue from Reggie auctions and for capacity market auctions to implement thermal programs. So those incentives will still be in the field. And those credits will be redeemable under these rules as essentially revenue to grow further services. And so, and, and then there are also tier three incentives in the field. Green Mountain Power, Washington Electric Co-op, VEC, VIPSA, they all have incentives for things like heat pumps, right? And so, in the awarding of those credits, it ought to be a sort of fair allocation of costs. And so if the, if the, for example, if the heat pump is installed using contractors trained under the efficiency excellence network, there's costs to that training that led to the installation and proper installation of that measure. And so that is what we're asking for consideration and how these credits get allocated in a single project, because these projects are gonna to have to get split up among all of the existing entities. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. Representative Logan. So um, I just wanna get clarity on this point because I think I support it. Uh, you're asking that we consider the effort required to train up the workforce um, to accomplish um, these goals as part of the overall calculation um, of a clean heat credit or what, a, what could count as the retirement of a clean heat credit? A credit will be generated based on energy savings and greenhouse gas reduction. Right. <clears throat> but a single project may involve multiple parties. And if clean heat credits are essentially the market-based mechanism for getting revenue back into the organization that made the investment mm -hmm. to then encourage hopefully more projects moving forward, then if, if the allocation of credits in that project do not fairly allocate or are not fairly sort of representational of the full cost of the project, and that full cost includes that training and the apprenticeship programs, mm -hmm. then you're essentially undervaluing the entity who wants to or has been directed to invest in the workforce development. Yeah. I mean, so I absolutely, I mean, I agree. The people who are actually installing the heat pumps are the people who are responsible for reducing emissions. Yes. And so we need to train people and we've heard about the workforce that we're going to need to develop in order to um, meet these goals in the long term. Um, what I think is interesting about that, though, is that training right now is not specifically. Training is nowhere named. 
in S5 as part of the cost of implementation. So correct. Um, figuring out how to phrase that. Yes. I think so. So we did identify. Um, we did identify one section, section 8127, that we would be happy to provide some some language around. But I think getting, as you just said, some language representing those services, workforce training, market development specifically would be very helpful in thinking about that. And so we'd be happy to provide that. And so uh, Representative Spiele already asked, but just to make sure when you do submit your testimony that you'll, you're you gonna provide suggested language? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, now, the, what I was referring, what in terms of the allocation of credits, that's kind of thinking about efficiency Vermont's role and our progress of, of TEPF. The default delivery agent would be assigned credits to then transfer over to the to the obligated parties. So for them, they would need to also sort of be reflected in that. But an important point is that the default delivery agent would be assigned for getting those projects early. And so one of the things that we've identified and it's not addressed in the legislation is how would those projects actually get paid for in full based on the lifetime valuation of those credits. And so um, that's something that we're thinking about and we're gonna, we don't have an answer to, but I'd be happy to continue working with the committee on um, making sure that if the projects are expected to be completed and paid for upfront, that there's money in the pool for the DDA to actually access and complete those projects. And right now that's kind of, that's something that we'll be working through. Representative Bongards. Um, thinking about, the um, training for workforce, and actually also mentioned training for business owners to help them make the conversion. Is there a piece to help this with? Is there any way to jumpstart that before? Because the, the bills can really go into full effect for two years, and then we start, then we yeah. lost more time. Yeah. There's two years in between when, if we know this is going to have to happen, Yes. Any suggestions on how we can jumpstart that process so that by the time we get there, we've already done a lot of this work? Short answer is that Efficiency Vermont is very much anticipating and working on workforce development activities right now. And last year, the legislature approved $2 million in workforce development work. Uh, we have a $1 million grant right now with uh, Neighbor Works of Western Vermont, and we have up to three different grants on a, a total of about $1 million for workforce development to focus on training and um, gaining new entrants into the workforce. And so the short answer is, uh, and those are all ARPA dollars. I, sh I should have prefaced that. Those are, those are ARPA dollars that we are being granted um, by the Department of Public Service and have agree an agreement in place with. We anticipate that as, and we're about to sign and work with the department on another $35 million grant for weatherization services. So we very much see workforce development as being part of the rollout of those ARPA dollars, which in our mind is a very good ramp to the level of activity that would be required under S5. What about the what about the training for business owners about how to make this, how to make the switch and how to get there? What about that portion of it? Yes. Um, and actually the FDA, I think I'm not. I hope I'm not, <laughs> but we're working with VFDA on um, one of those grants. And they're talking about that exactly. Okay, um, great. Now, um, one last recommendation, which is, um, I, think, I think I've been pretty consistent in identifying that our priority here is, is weatherization services. Um, but we just really want to point out that there is a deep interrelationship between the energy used in a home, the greenhouse gas reductions, and the opportunity for energy security and comfort and health and wellness through weatherization. And this is widely understood in the energy and 
and energy efficiency sector as being one of the more expensive measures, but most important uh, for achieving multiple value streams. And those value streams are all of the things I just mentioned, cost savings for the resident, health benefits, comfort, but it is rather expensive and on a greenhouse gas reduction basis. And one of the opportunities that uh, was pursued in say the tier three program was that if you were doing weatherization at the same time as you were installing a heat pump, you got bonus credits, uh, essentially additional uh, tier three credits for compliance if you were if you were doing a project at the same time. And so I would encourage, the, uh, as the legislature cons considers this bill, are there additional opportunities like that here where if you do an electrification and weatherization project, that that sort of creates compounding benefits. And um, I don't have any firm suggestions on what that would look like right now, but I would just say that the precedent has been set in that tier three program, and we would certainly be looking for um, similar type of considerations. Representative Lewis, um, with the PUC here, would you be willing to respond to that recommendation? Is that something you'd be interested in responding to, rather? Well, it's hard to say in the abstract absence seeing any specific language, um, but uh, I would agree with the concept. It's, it's well known that heat pumps will be more effective in a weatherized house. Um, rather than heating the outside, we're heating the inside. So I, you know, it's a very laudable goal. Is that something that would be addressed in the rulemaking? Does it need to be in statute? Um, it's perhaps at this point a something to think about in the in the context of um as tom just rightfully said and you know if if your home is not well weatherized you can add a heat pump to a room and on paper it might be displacing fossil fuel usage in the basement for your furnace but in practical effect you're just bleeding out of a different room the heat that you're putting into it and so in the technical advisory group, there was, a, there was a consideration of the fact that you're saving more energy if you weatherize first, and so therefore reducing overall fuel use. And so if you, and I don't wanna get into too many technical details, but essentially the legislature could, could identify this through compounding benefits or consideration of multiple clean heat measures installed at the same time as creating multiple benefits. I understand your concept. I'm just saying, do we need to put it in statute? Oh. I, I just, I guess we could yeah. make it a clear policy priority and then it would be addressed through the rulemaking. That's what I'm hearing. Yes. Okay, thank you. Representative Pat. Um, I, un I understand the, the, some of the benefits of, of coupling uh, on the on the other hand, um, uh, my concern, and this comes from a lot of constituents uh, I'm 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 hearing from who who are uh, uh, just to this is almost a standard uh, uh, message. Uh, I'm a, an older person on fixed income. I can't. I am not going to change out my my heating system. I'm concerned that we that we need to give. Uh, we, we need the message needs to be no matter what, whether what weatherized first. If I mean, if that hasn't been done in in, in a home, uh, because um, the the message or the impression a lot of people are getting is that they that they they need to change their heating system uh, when right. when if that's not going to work for them or they're not going to do it. We want to make sure that the, the single most effective thing to do is, is, uh, is weatherization regardless. I, my, I'm just expressing that. I, I, I share that sentiment. And one of the, um, we're, we're actually running a pilot right now um, with some of our uh, Efficiency Modernization Act uh, pilot funds uh, to go to homes that had previously been weatherized and install heat pumps for low-income residents at no cost to them. And so um, this is one of those examples where weatherization first 
followed up with a heat pump and electrification can truly reduce energy costs for those fixed income individuals. So I think conceptually, we are 100% aligned with that idea that if you go in after weatherization, that's when you can really start saving the resident a significant amount of money. Can you tell us who who's keeping track of the dollars that are being spent on weatherization already? As a single entity or the regulated entity, there is statewide. Statewide, there's no single entity assigned with tracking all weatherization expenses between OEO, the department, uh, the department and PUC's oversight of VGS and efficiency Vermont. But we do coordinate and collaborate extensively and have done so um, even more since the ARPA funds have uh, come into the state because that level of funding has really required an unprecedented but helpful level of coordination uh, between OEO and the weatherization agencies and even the RPCs and, and the efficiency utilities like BGS and Efficiency Vermont. Representative Sibelia. When uh, S5 enacted changes that uh, track of weatherization. Yeah, large. that's a good question for other stakeholders, but I will offer my best opinion, which is that, um, and we have done some of this through the <clears throat> Comprehensive Energy Plan uh, of the Department of Public Service. Um, we have ourselves sort of looked at it and come up with back of the envelope type of models, um, you know, between, between the weatherization agencies, Efficiency Vermont, BGS, you know, estimates can sort of be made, but, and then that would be used to inform obviously the potential study. Um, but I think that um, right now, I did not see anything in the bill that would require statewide tracking of specific weatherization activities, only the tracking and formation of those clean heat credits. And so what I interpret the S5 to include is that you would have tracking of different clean heat credits based on the type of measure that was installed. And so like, for example, the 16% um, the requirement for low income, 16% requirement for moderate income, and then half of that needs to be permanent installations. All of that sort of tells me that these clean heat credits will have and be tracked in different ways where potentially you've got a weatherization credit, you've got an electrification credit, and then you've got a shorter lived, essentially annual delivery of a, uh, like a biofuel credit. Okay. Representative Tori. Just back to the potential study. Does that include um, financing, survey of different financing that's already on the ground, homes or potential new financing that should be considered? I have not seen a survey be a specific call out in a potential study. It might be one of the sort of underlying assumptions that capital can be made available to bring high cost projects into the fold. Um, but I have not seen that be a specific call out in a potential study. They tend to be very focused around um, how much your customer is willing to sort of do in a given year. And one of, so, so that's what I mean by it's an underlying assumption that some customers may have access to capital that are in addition to, say, like an incentive. Thanks. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. And I will follow up with the committee on some of these recommendations. That would be great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Great members. Um, that is it for the morning's testimony. Um, yeah, and then we're on the floor. <clears throat> Excuse me, at one. Representative Stebbins, please um, talk. Thanks, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Just a reminder, since there's been so much discussion on workforce today, um, at noon, at room 267, um, we have a bunch of folks showing up from the statewide uh, workforce, climate workforce initiative. So a bunch of folks training people and scholars. So. Great, thank you for that. And pizza. And pizza. Pizza. All right, Scott, we will adjourn for the morning. Thank you.